Yeah. They say I'm confrontational. I want peace, just not at the cost of my silence. Speak I'm up. Through the hood, I keep hearing people say I'm supposed to die tonight. They can't destroy what they ain't built in the first place. So I'm finna ride this way. I went from a true seeker to true speaker. Chew through the booth, your Bluetooth and your cool speaker. Yeah. Run up in here, I cut an ear, I'm too Peter. I bucket fear, I chuck a spear like Lou Peter. They love it here, I hate it here. They murder babies and pervert the children and make it here. It's getting crazy, everybody claiming they gangster here. And everybody feel it, but nobody is saying here. This car over money, so I say what I want, dog. Yeah. Your favorite rapper don't need too afraid to be broke, dog. You lose your career pissing in folks. Uh -huh. But you can call black women hoes and kill all the black men that you won't go. Yeah. And I don't care if you hate that, I could take that. I could take but that. Stop claiming you real, knowing you hate that. Sad thing is how fast you could diss a black queen and turn around and walk on eggshells for a drag queen. Bizzle, this what you wanna do? Yeah. I never came for the smaller. If you gotta go down, then let's get it poppin'. And see, that really ain't what I want. If you gotta go down, then let's get it Say what I want And if it gotta go down Then let's get it poppin' I really love peace But I'm ready for the war So if it gotta go down Then let's get it poppin' World full of fake news, nothing real about it uh, Put their agenda in the middle and just build around it You don't use your own brain, they gon' flip the whole thing And trick you with a headline to tell you how to feel about it Call a man a racist, you take what he said racially Call him homophobic, you take what he said hatefully They label it hate, you can't even disagree tastefully To shake the label, you switch sides, it's mind slavery These people are evil, don't eat what the media feeding you Deceitful and wicked, they giving you lenses to see it through Everybody Line. Nobody willing to speak the truth like the Lord said it would be. Maybe we'll see him soon. Bizzle. Yeah. I never came for the smoke. If it gotta go down, then let's get it poppin'. And see, that really ain't what I want. If it gotta go down, then let's get it poppin'. You can't muzzle me, dog. I say what I want. And if it gotta go down, then let's get it poppin'. I really love peace, but I'm ready for the war. So if it gotta go down, then let's get it they trying to turn your little boy into a princess And they ain't even gave him a chance to be a prince yet They sick of gender telling you to let him clip his member what? He can't even pick his bedtime, but he could pick his gender oh. They say that I ain't woke, I say they ignorant. they ignorant See, I remember how the pilgrims did the Indians let me Remember, they ain't just attack him, they befriended him Gave him blankets full of diseases and ended him Outrage, footage leaking every other week or two So you don't see the blankets, they sneaking you uh. They ain't gotta squeeze at you, they feminizing your males and leading you into a lifestyle that won't allow you to reproduce. One black life gone, they'll march in the street with you. They hand you a blanket to say abortion is free for you. How else you gonna get ex-slaves to agree with you? To kill themselves, say you giving them the freedom to. Bizzle, let's wake them up. I never came for the small. If it gotta go down, then let's get it poppin'. And see, that really ain't what I want. If it gotta go down, then let's get it poppin'. You can't muzzle me, dog. I say what I want. And if it gotta go down, then let's get it poppin'. I really love peace, but I'm ready for the war. So if it gotta go down, then let's get it poppin'. Man, you all know exactly who I am, man. You know um, the job I'm paid for is um, in higher education as assistant vice president of student support at Pitt Community College here in Greenville, North Carolina, but also the uh, founder chief visionary officer for the main initiative, as well as the founding president of You Good, you Good Bro Incorporated. Um, you know, You Good Bro is a solution for a focused nonprofit entity. You know, it's just designed to provide a safe space and a brave space for transparency, vulnerability, and liberation. Um, it's a space where it's okay to say that you're not okay, but also for sheer accountability, brothers. Um, our experiences are with like minded individuals uh, in the sense of just creating a non judgmental zone uh, with everyone who fellowships and just embrace the realities of being a man but also strategizing of how do we navigate some of these critical areas that are essential for us to be examples of healthy manhood. Uh, we operate from the hashtag mental health movement where you read between the lines 
The emphasis is on men heal men. And I think that we all can agree that the goal is that when somebody asks you that you good, bro, you can actually say yes and mean it. Um, a lot of inspirations to you, good bro. Uh, one of them being just my life story of molestation, no father in the home, depression, suicidal ideations, um, distrust in black men, a diagnosed mental illness, a bipolar two disorder, and understanding that they're just brothers out there, just like my myself, who needed a space um, like this. That if we had a chance to have this when we were younger, we may have been able to kind of deal with the trauma that we have been exposed to a lot better. Um, you good bro is built off of three pillars. Um, that's guided by scripture. Uh, number one, coming together in partnership is connected to Hebrews 10. And let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. And let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do. Uh, number two, uh, protection from the enemy. You know, the goal when we leave this place is to, you know, it's for liberation um, and that you be delivered from some of the areas in your life that's been stopping you from being your best self. But, you know, we all know that when it comes to being liberated, that the enemy is just going to take it to another level. Um, and that's connected to Luke 4. It just talks about Jesus being, of the, you know, full of the Holy Spirit, um, was also just, you know, led to the, uh, to the spirit, by the spirit into the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the enemy. Um, and that when the enemy had finished all of his tempting, he left until an opportune time. Um, and the reality is, is that will be opportune times, brothers. And, you know, you just got to get your artillery up because, you know, spiritual and internal warfare is real. And then just the power of prayer, you know, this is connected to uh, Philippians 4, that you don't worry about anything, but instead pray about everything. You know, you tell God what you need and to thank him for all that he's done. And then you experience God's peace, uh, which exceeds anything you could ever, ever understand. Uh, I got a set of ground rules, you know, have fun, relax, enjoy the conversation. You know, understand that you can agree to disagree. Um, do not withhold how you feel, what you feel, but with all respect, unapologetically <clears throat> speak on how you feel. Uh, when you speak, speak your truth. Uh, there's no right or wrong. If you have questions, just ask brothers. And, um, and also, if you hear something that moves you, man, tweet, tweet it, post it on your Facebook, um, Instagram, just hashtag it, you good, bro, um, in hopes that people can see that, you know, these types of conversations are taking place, even in the virtual world. Um, but that's the foundation of you good, bro, man. If we can briefly go around, um, you know, just do some quick introductions, man. Um, I think that brothers pretty much know one another that's in this space this morning. Um, so if we can just kind of make it quick, man, it'll be, you know, we can kind of proceed into this, this heavy conversation this morning. Uh, we'll just start off with, uh, Don, you up at the top left of my screen, bro. If you can open us up in the introductions and then, you know, brothers just, you know, just fall in. Absolutely, man. Donald Morton, CEO of the Reman Project. We help black businessmen uh, break the vicious cycles of uh, interrupt patterns, disrupt behaviors of missed potential so that those brothers can transform their lives, leadership and legacy. Good morning to every brother. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. So I go next. Um, Marquise Jones, to make myself no reputation, you know, I'm um, just a chef, uh, lived in Greenville for a minute, now reside in Raleigh, so um, just good to see the brothers healthy, strong, and um, just trying to keep the conversation moving. Yo, what's up? Good morning, everybody. You know, um, it's your boy, Black Season. Um, <laughs> um, it's Fleet. I um, it's good to be here this morning with y'all, man. I um, I mean, everybody know I'm, I'm a project manager for Elite Disaster Consultant, and I hustle twenty four seven. So um, it's good to be here. Um, and uh, you know, what I'm saying I love y'all, niggas. Love you, too, Love you too, bro. And I'm gonna miss y'all this afternoon, man. So hold me down. Hey, look, I think we'll <laughs> recover a little bit better. We'll be all right. <laughs> oh, yeah, you do be bowling. Okay, I forgot about that. Putting yeah, that work on a little jumping back in the day. <laughs> he dusted off, man. <laughs> oh, Calvin Sampson here for a uh, uh, faithful me member of the kingdom of God. Um, just happy to be here. I've been, uh, like Jazz said, UGB certified for two years now, man. Just thank God for the platform. 
he put this on addressing mental health. I still got that, see that mantra in my head, what, uh, men heal men. Well, mental, mental health, go ahead, what was it? Mental health movement. What mental health movement, yeah, yeah. So that's why I flew off. I see you, Justin. Good morning, everybody. Uh, Justin Fuller here. Um, need the conversation today. Need to be amongst the brothers, so good to be here. Appreciate y'all. Glad you on, bro. Justin, with the dark night voice. <laughs> We got um, Ian and uh, Kelly. Yeah, I'll go. Uh, good morning, y'all. Good to be with y'all again this morning. Um, Ian Davis, um, chem former chemist. <laughs> uh, nothing special, but um, I'll be dropping off at 10, but I'll try to listen and participate as much as I can. Ian, what's up, man? Kels. Yo, peace, blessings, elevation. Kelly Little, king, disruptor, confronter, agitator, <laughs> and brother to my fellow kings. Peace. Right. Peace, peace. Tez, Tez and Rick, go ahead and jump in there and do the intro so Calvin can, can, can stimulate y'all brothers this morning. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> That's way to me explain it. It's about to be good. Good morning, brothers. My name is Montez Bishop. Uh, glad to be uh, amongst you guys again. Um, Visions College coordinator at Pitt Community College. The Bishop. And how far from that from that PhD, bro? Man, <laughs> I'm going through it, man. I'm um, in the middle of. Um, you know, making my corrections and stuff like that. So I'm over halfway done. So hopefully the early part of next year, I'll be done. I'll be through. So just keep me in your prayers. That's just we'll, get to, we'll get to call you Dr. Bishop. Yes, sir. <laughs> All right. I'm, prof I'm prophesizing right now, everybody. I receive it, Dr. brother. Bishop. I receive it. <laughs> Rick, you next, bro. Uh, good morning, brothers. Uh, Ricky Stanley uh, from reside in Wilson, North Carolina, originally from Mahoskey. I'm a cybersecurity engineer for uh, Truist Bank. All right, all right. All right, brothers. Um, I mean, it's time to go ahead and, and kind of dive really deep this morning. This, uh, this, uh, this convening this morning is tied to um, a convening that uh, we held last year around this time, if not a um, late summer, I think. Um, which Calvin, Calvin, um, Calvin wrote a book, man, called "The Identity Theft That Called the Identity Crisis," and, um, and we had some conversation just about the impact of the book, but also the information that he was able to research um, that was vetted. I mean, by um, a number of folks that he highly respects in the spiritual space out there. Um, and I, and I, really, I really don't want to go too far into it and I'll allow him to, 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 to pretty much, you know, run the show this morning. But I uh, know we started out last year um, and it was impactful, um, but it also, it also was something that, um, that I think that there were some ears who were not prepared for it. Um, but it was, but the timing was right. The timing was right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just take my take a step back and allow Calvin to kind of pretty much go into um, this morning's discussion. Um, it's going to be a very stimulating discussion. Um, I think that brothers are going to really engage in this conversation. It's going to force you to think, though. It's going to force you to think. Um, but I digress, man. Using his words, I digress, and I'll go ahead and <laughs> pass the money. Thanks, Jasmine. Appreciate you. Love you. And like, like last year, or like any time I do a UGB session, I like to start out with a little icebreaker. So I, I got this icebreaker video that I want, want you to see. It's about uh, 90 seconds, but it talks about Satan's strategy, how he gets after the brothers, especially us as Black men. So uh, let's 
Let's see this icebreaker, then we're going to talk about it. Oh, light work. Peace, King. Hey, you want to talk? You want to introduce yourself real quick, Vaughn? Yeah, before we just I jump in? introductions. Go ahead and introduce yourself to the brothers. Uh, man, I'm, I'm Vaughn Norwood. Um, you know, I, I can say Vaughn clearly now, you know, since I'm part of the community. <laughs> you know, so, so I'm Vaughn Norwood, owner of Light Work Resources Holistic Health Center, where we do therapy and coaching primarily. Um, we also do things like yoga, meditation, master classes, um, workshops. Um, but um, I'm, I'm just a part of the journey of um, assisting black men and boys in, in the healing process. And I'm, I'm happy to be a part of that journey. Um, I've, I've been a part of many journeys. I've been inspired by many journeys. And um, I'm inspired by you guys as well. That's why I'm here. Thanks for having me. Yes, sir. Hey, look, you, you, you saved me, Vaughn, because I was struggling with the uh, with the technical difficulties, but I'm back. I'm back. <laughs> hey, timing is beautiful. Hold on. <laughs> a frog is a cold-blooded animal, and humans are warm-blooded, so our body burns energy or perspires to maintain the same 98.6 degrees. The cold-blooded frog's body temperature goes up and down with the temperature of its surroundings. Although frogs love water, when I hold it over this pot of boiling water, this frog is very uncomfortable and climbs to get away from it. Now the water in this pot is room temperature, 69.4 degrees, so he's comfortable when I put him in. If I turn the burner on low flame, his body temperature will adjust and slowly he will heat up with the water. The water temperature has risen to 80 degrees and the frog is the same temperature and still comfortable. If I turn up the burner slowly again, he won't notice because he'll continue to change to be the same as his surroundings. When we started, I held the frog over the first pot of boiling water. He was uncomfortable and he tried to get away from the heat. But now, because we're raising the temperature slowly, he doesn't recognize the danger he's in. He just keeps going along with the changes in his surroundings. Eventually, we can turn up the burner to a deadly boil. He will just keep trying to adjust with it. By the time he realizes it's killing him, it's too late. He won't notice in time because he just keeps changing himself to go along with the changes in his surroundings. All right. Shalom, shalom. So uh, that was a little icebreaker clip right there just to show the climate of what was going to in the world. And I, I want to get a take on the brothers to see what y'all saw in that. Hey, not too fast. Everybody slow down. Don't put your hands up too fast. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, look, think of the frog. I need you to explain it to me. So look at the frog as us. Look at the look at the pot as the world. And look at the fire as, as the cares of the world or as distractions, right? And instead of jumping out the pot, we just try to adapt to it even if it's killing us. And sometimes we don't even know it's killing us. Sometimes we can make our, our bed in a comfortable bed of thorns, right? And I, and I think that's what's going on right now. I think that's the strategy Satan is using, I believe. Um, that's why I chose that, that clip. But I was, I was wondering what y'all thought about that. You know, I, I seen that back in high school a while back. And for some reason, it still resonates with me today. Man, I thought you was about to do some chemistry work over there, man. I was interested <laughs> until it said no frogs or harm. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'll eat frogs. I was like, was it real? <laughs> <laughs> you know, if there's Peter out there, I had to put that in there. I had to put that in there. But like, it was just a little iceberg, man. And I, and I'm and I, it goes with the uh, uh, the title of my book, uh, the identity theft, which caused the identity crisis. You know, and I think history been shoved down our throat to the point where we on autopilot and we don't realize 
for instance, why we call each other king, right? And, and it's it was something that that I think I don't know. Quis, you said it one time before, and I don't know if you quoted it from somebody else. But if you leave us alone, we'll go on autopilot and start realigning with who we really are. If you leave us alone, and I think what the identity theft did it snatched something away from us and caused us to be that frog because we don't know who we are. So that that was my 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 motivation for uh, making this book, right? It was to show people that, uh, mainly show people that this Bible is not just an allegorical book or a book of uh, soothsayings or proverbs, but it's a historical book. It's something that you can actually look in and reference who you are and it's been hidden to us. So that's what made me go on this journey, right? So uh, I'm gonna do a quick recap because like Jeff said, I did this last year um, and it was impactful. And, and uh, it's, a, it's a seven day devotional and day one and day two, I laid a spiritual foundation and then I jump into the historical uh, portions of what we, uh, what we miss. So just to do a quick recap, um, uh, five W's I went over who I am. Uh, mo most of y'all know who I am. Uh, my testimony got born again in 2006. Um, and it didn't, didn't get it right till about 2018. You understand what I'm saying? But it's cool. I'm stronger for it, right? Uh, I, I was born in New York during the crack epidemic in the 80s, right? So I had a, a disdain for, for authority. Uh, because I was in a broken home, I had a disdain for male authority, right? Uh, but not knowing God would use that. He, he, I swear he used your weaknesses to promote strength, right? So I went over that testimony, went over when I got saved, um, just showed y'all where it's going with this and primarily uh, endeavoring into the project is trying to line up biblical history with the, with the history that they teach the world. Like, did y'all know that Alexander the Great is in the Bible? You understand what I'm saying? So that was why I endeavored into this project. Um, so... Talking about um, day one and day two, I started with the with what they call the antediluvian phase, the pre-flood, because uh, there were civilizations before the flood and there were civilizations after. So, of course, God was mad with the world, uh, told Noah he going to repopulate the world with his sons, him and his sons, Noah, Shem, and Japheth. Uh, uh, I'm saying Noah, Shem, and Japheth. Japheth is firstborn, Shem is secondborn, Ham his thirdborn. I, uh, day one and two, I talked on on Shem, the the lineage of Shem. Um, this is the chronological uh, or the uh, gene genealogy genealogy of Shem. Um, so, like I said, when when we, when we and I love it when we say king, we how we defer, refer to each other as kings. But really, do we really know where that word comes from? So, if you look at the and, and not only that, oh, I'll get to that. But if you look at the genealogy of Shem. It follows through a, fa a fax ad, Eber, where we get the word Hebrew, Heber, and it, and it translated into Hebrew, uh, followed by Abraham. And if you look at Abraham's uh, second born, not his first born, Ishmael, but his second born, Isaac, um, the promise, if, if, if you look at the pattern of God, the promise is always in the second born, right? The, and back in traditional settings, the promise was in the first born, but God had the promise in the second born. So it wasn't... Um, Jacob, it was it wasn't Esau, it was Jacob, right? It, it wasn't uh King Saul, it was King David. Um, it, you know what I mean? The promise was always in that second uh born. So when Isaac was born, Isaac begat Jacob. Now, if you look down at the Israelites, it was 12 tribes, right? Each tribe had an identity. And I'm getting to the point where why we call each other kings. The identity of Judah would held the scepter, they were the kings, right? And I just want to leave that there like that and let that marinate. But also, if you look at Shem, it, it's funny how after I, I got this revelation about uh, who we were, I started looking at like news and CNN, which I don't watch no more. But I love how anytime they did something against a particular race, they called them anti-Semitic. And, and I always wonder where that word uh, Semite or Semitic came from. It came from the word Shem. The H, when, the, when uh, the Hebrew Bible was translated to Greek, they removed the H. So instead of being Shemitic, you became Semitic. Um, so I always find out, like, when they talk about being anti-Semitic, I wonder do they know every time they shoot an innocent Black man in the street, <laughs> do they really know what being anti-Semitic is? 
But um, day one and day two, I touched on that. Uh, let's see here. Uh, day one, we talked about the fruits of the trees, where we eating from, you know, uh, in the garden of Eden, God had two trees in the, in the garden. He told you to eat, you can eat from one, but can't eat from the other. And uh, Jazz, I think last year had the women on, right? And uh, maybe I was a little intimidated, Jazz, maybe not, but I didn't go too hard on the women about how in the Bible, it talks about how the man desired his wife, but the wife didn't necessarily desire her man. She desired that God like power. Because if you notice, and, and it's not it's not all her fault, because if you notice, if you read scripture, Satan was right next to both of them. So Adam could have intervened and interject when he was having a conversation. When the snake was having a conversation with his wife, he could have interject, but he didn't. But Eve had that desire for the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And, and it, it reminds me of where we are today, right? How we just ever, ever increasing in knowledge, but we getting further and further away from real truth. Um, I think I read an article. Let me see. I think I read an article uh, from the Wall Street Journal, was it? About how uh, about two point something billion people, there you go, there are 45 million borrowers who collectively owe more than $1.5 trillion in student loan. And that was from Forbes. Student loan debt statistics is $1.5 trillion. And, and like, I'm, I'm one of them that went to school, got all this debt. But what did I learn, right? Am I learning a quadratic formula, a uh, quadratic equation right now? So uh, um, I talked about what, what, what tree be eating from primarily what light we're eating off of, because both was light. According to God, both trees was light. Just one was his light, the other was dark light. So we touched on that, it was deep, showed the video about that. And, but I wanted people to pay attention to how we translate light. The word light means, uh, is translated luminous uh, or, um, what is it, loose, uh, loose, L-U-C-E. And that's where we get the word Lucifer from. Um, and there was cults created from that. So we, talk, we talked on that a little bit. Um, everything has a genesis. In the beginning to, uh, to where we are started, the Garden of Eden represented the beginning of where we are today. One tree, is a reputation of the world, the other represents uh, God. Um, let's see, the tree of knowledge is a representation of light, but it's not God's light, it's Satan's light. Um, this is why we must be born again into the light and out of the darkness. So uh, we, talk, we touched on the word Lucifer mean light bringer. Another translation of Lucifer besides light is luminous, which means to illuminate. And in the 1700s, Satan light burnt or Satan's light birth follows known as the illuminated ones. And we spoke on uh, the Illuminati of Freemasons as well. And uh, we touched on the fact how um, a gentleman by the name of Albert Pike kind of solidified uh, this, this dark light. Um, and if anybody knows family members, which I have a whole bunch of them in this, in this, uh, in this fraternity, Albert Pike is a pillar of this fraternity. So uh, I wanted people to pay attention to Albert Pike. An example of dark light was found in the life of an elected sovereign, grand commander of the Scottish Rite Southern jurisdiction named Albert Pike. We will discuss him today. Last year I said we would discuss him in day three, but we discussing him today. Um, still recapping, we went over uh, the creator and the imitator. Right, everything God does, Satan perverts. Right, so I wanted to touch on the fact of God has this Father, God, Son, Holy Spirit, unholy Trinity. That perversion is Satan, Antichrist, false prophet. Right, I wanted to touch on that, and I wanted to focus on um, two sides of the story. So if, if if God comes out with a turkey and cheese sandwich, Satan's gonna come out with a cheese and turkey sandwich molded. I just wanted to touch on that comparison, that dichotomy. So, and I'm, I'm speeding through this. We talked about going back to school. Um, and this, 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 I think this statement reigns true. The A student works for the B student and the C student runs the business and the D student dedicates the building. I think that's interesting because we think school or this traditional institution is setting us forward, but is actually uh, setting us backwards. 
Uh, we talked about day two. We went through how there's giants in the land. Um, it's not a fable. It's not a fairy tale. Uh, and, and part of that uh, was the gene splicing that took place. And it's going on today like the days of Noah. Noah did say that uh, you'll know his time is coming because the, the world would be like the days of Noah. And if you, if, if, if you study Genesis 3, that's what was going on. Um, there was a lot of... Uh, a lot of debauchery, I guess you can say. This is why the earth was flooded. This is why dinosaurs are no more. So uh, we touched on that. It was very interesting. Uh, we had a good time. Uh, and I put this slide up to show you what's going on. I don't know. Have y'all touched? Have y'all seen this stuff going on or read about this? Whereas uh, the first, the first part is the um, the cat that they genetically put the uh, the Achilles on their cat. Or even the chicken, they, the GMO on the chicken, how they produce in featherless chickens. No, I never seen it, bro. Yeah, so there was some articles that was being ran in uh, some of the newspaper, how they was genetically modifying to try to make things easier on us. And one of those mod uh, genetically modified organisms was the chicken. They started creating featherless chickens, but it didn't do well because people started... Uh, throwing up when they saw the chicken. They, I guess they wanted feathers on their chicken, right? And we all know about uh, the liger and the tigon, um, or some of us may know how they started uh, genetically producing a lion mixed with a tiger. Uh, this was some of the gene splice in the, um, the fish, the glow in the dark fish, or if like, they did this with a lot of soldiers on the top right with the, with the mouse growing an ear on the back, on, on the back of their uh, spine. A lot of soldiers, they was losing limbs and they was trying to figure out ways of how to uh, reproduce that. But that's the things that was going on, uh, you know, a science, people becoming their own God type thing. And we discussed that uh, a little bit. Am I going too fast? Let me know if I'm going too fast. Because I, I really want this to be like, I spoke to Jazz yesterday. I really want this to be a dialogue and not a monologue. And I really want y'all to ask questions. That's why, like, I don't mind cut like sometimes I could get excited that's why I got freaking um cue cards here because I could go off tangent but I really want us to to know what y'all think I really want to know what y'all think have y'all thought about like what's going on in the world today have y'all thought about like GMOs have y'all thought about giants have y'all thought about some of the fraternities we used to be in I mean I was 14 and I pledged in the order of the fraternity because you know we, the bible says we perishing for that lack of knowledge Right, the world it teaches that ignorance is bliss, but the Bible said you're dying because you don't know. So I, I really want to change that narrative. I want us to have a trajectory that's uh, moving up and not moving up blindly or just moving laterally. So please, uh, just cut me off. Talk to me if if I'm going too fast or if I'm uh, say some things that I need to elaborate on. But that was part of a day two. This is still part of the recap. Let me see. Uh, but we also went over the, the curse of Hamla. And I, I thought it was critical to go over that because a lot of us are, are still believing um, we descendants of, of Ham, right? Um, and it, it, it was a lie because as, as you start looking at DNA and thank God for DNA, a, a good chunk over 90% of every African-American, if they were to do their DNA, they track back to that slave coast. And I'm going to show you as we go along that uh, I don't know if y'all know about phenotypes, um, uh, anthropology, but there's three primary skull types in the world. There's the Negroid skull, Mongoloid skull, and uh, uh, Caucasoid skull. And when I did research on this, it blew my mind how you could be a dark-skinned Caucasoid. Obama, perfect example. He's a what you would call an and anthropological uh, surroundings or community of dark skinned Caucasus because his daddy was from Kenya, not the slave coast. So uh, we, we, we went over that, the curse of Hamla, um, debunk, right? <laughs> all right, so uh, I think that's all a recap. Let me see. Yep, that's all a recap uh, of day one and day two, just setting up spiritual foundation of um, where we at. Uh, before we jump into day three, any questions may have gone too fast. Any questions on that? 
Yo, somebody unmute yourself and just say, no, no question, something. <laughs> Hey, Cal, I got to say this, man. What you brought up about Shim is true. So there's a book I started reading a while ago and I hadn't got through it. It was like, um, yep. yep. Babylon and Timbuktu. This is what my yep. godbrother put me on. And this is when, you know, I was in a part where they were breaking down like um, Jaffa, the Shim, and, and um, Ham, whatever. And um, the thing is, is I always thought that was so crazy is that anytime a black person makes some type of so quote unquote derogatory remark about a Jewish person, Right, you see it all the time, right? They want to be like, oh, they're anti-Semitic. And I'm like, I was wondering, like, what, what does that mean? What does that mean? And I remember after reading that, I was just like, well, technically, the not technically, really, truly, the original Semites were basically us. <laughs> we're Africa. So it's just like, you can't be anti yourself. It is. <laughs> and so, but the thing is that there's so much that's going on out here that, you know, people, like you said, people kind of like fall into this like funnel of, of like ignorance, you know what I'm saying? And it's like, okay, well, this is all this is what's always been said, so it must be true. So then everybody just like falls in line in that funnel of um ignorance. And I was just like, I've always never really understood it about the anti-Semitic. Oh, he said something about these white, you know, these white person, these white people having to be Jewish. I was like, well, y'all know that they're actually black Jewish people, and right. it tells you right here. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that, and so Dr. Rudolph Windsor, he helped me a lot, man. Yeah. A lot. And so I'm just like, man, it, 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 so it's just, I think what all we really have to do is there's a lot of stuff we've been taught that's just flat out wrong, man. And then it's like, and it's not going to happen overnight. It's like just kind of chipping it like a little bit at a time. Like, okay, well, this ain't right. Let me read up on this and keep on reading and reading and reading. And eventually we just have to kind of like reverse all the bullshit that's been taught right. to us, man. And, and, I, and I think, I think yeah. Vaughn said it best. Uh, when I was presenting last year, Vaughn said that you study, you study, you absorb, you absorb to the point where you got to let it out. And I think my letting out and breaking point was yeah. writing this book. And yeah. then coming up, thank God for Jazz Platform, coming up with this presentation. I don't know if you remember that, Vaughn. You told me that and you ministered to me so hard, man, and, and it resonated with me. I, and I didn't, I, you know, I, I did the Calvin translation, but Vaughn, if, if, if you remember that, when you said you just increase, you increase, and then you let it out, and I let it out in his book. You remember you was telling me about that? I do. That's yeah. what purpose is. Yeah. You know, once you do the research, um, do the research that you come up with, you know, how do you release it? You know, how do you get that message out that you want to um, spread to the to the community? And that's what you did. Yeah, and, and thank God for Jazz constantly doing, right? So what what what, what Doc Wooten talked on, touched on about that anti-Semitic and that Semitic and how roles were reversed. This is day three, four. And if I could get to four, so be it. If not, hey, God willing. But this is what I we moving past, not so much moving past, but we set the found spiritual foundation. And now I'm going to parallel history with this bible and we're gonna have a journey man we're gonna have a great journey so if all hearts and minds is clear anybody got something to say i got the short clip right now and that's, hey, that's real quick I mean, yes sir go ahead real man. quick samson look i think it was great you started off with the clip that you started off with because typically as humans we go through a process we are conditioned to believe one thing so, so this warfare is on multiple levels the first level is, particularly here right now in this time of dispensation, is what they put up and show you in either picture form or literature form. Because whether we know it or not, 95% of, and this is funny, people say they conscious, but really your subconscious mind rules your conscious mind. Yes, and so everything that you're absorbing from what you see and what you hear, and what you read can influence, not can, will influence what you think. So if you're not absorbing the information, then to Vaughn's point, we do the research, but there's a difference between true and truth, right? right. So true might be true today until we get more information wow. that actually causes us to really um, explore our previous thought process. If we're too tied or attached to 
the system that we've been conditioned in will never be able to embrace truth. Right. And so my thing is, make sure you don't allow your cup to get filled. The same time you pouring into that cup, that cup should have a hole. So you're actually releasing information so you can actually critically think about that information. Good. And then I ain't gonna go on the other one. We're gonna talk a little later, but on the whole <laughs> Masonic and Albert Pike thing, cause I could take you down a whole different route. Cause Albert Pike and those Masons were not the historical Masons that go back to El Kebulon, Kemet, what, Ethiopia, whatever you wanna call it, which was the original um, Egyptians. They were in Luxor and it's a whole different belief and belief right. system. That one was tied to um, Are you referring giving to like surface Prince Hall? to your fail. Say again. You refer to like Prince Hall when. Uh, well, I mean, even before you, you, you halfway Hall? there, but like, so Prince Hall is American. I'm going way back to the days right. of Egypt um, when you had the original folk whose uh, uh, focus was tied on manhood, your sleep, and your right. community. What was the whole basis of? what it was supposed to be. And then it got ruined because they say uh, York right and Scottish right. But yeah. truth be told, if you dig to the inception of what it was, it was Something about degrees. humanity. Yes, yes. So, and, and and the reason why I touched on Albert Pike is you're going to see it. And I want you to say something, Kelly, because a lot of these Masons, whether black or white, they know they learn Albert Pike just like they learned yep. Christopher Columbus. And I got to yep. touch on it. And you know, like Jazz says, I'm unapologetically like, <laughs> going to say it. And I ain't trying to hurt feelings, but we are dying for this stuff. So um, Doc Wooten touched on it, right? That uh, with the, from Babylon to Timbuktu by Dr. Rudolph Windsor, um, we never focus on Noah's first son. I'm gonna, I'm gonna show this clip and it's gonna touch on a, a genealogy of Japheth, but everybody, wants, I want y'all to see this clip. We all are infected with racism. We are taught to be racist in the schools. And here's just one example. Will you hold this up with please? How many of you have ever seen a map that looked like this before? How many of you have ever seen this map? Seen that map? Yeah. Isn't this the map that you use K through 16 in the United States of America? Now, folks, look at this map. According to your, so, your social studies teacher, what is the equator? Right An imaginary there, line where? Yeah. Around the center of the Earth. Then if, if this map is correct, then the equator must be here, and Chicago has a tropical climate. Now, folks, this is the map that we use in the schools. Look where the United States is in the middle of the world, right? Now, here's the USSR, which is no more, of course, Mongolia, China, Africa, uh, India, Pakistan, Afghanistan. Now, look over here. USSR, Mongolia, China, India, Pakistan, Afghanistan. Twindy is here. We have two Indias. Did you know that? Now, people, this is a flat-out lie. Look at the size of Greenland and the size of South America. According to your social studies teachers, what were continents? Largest land masses on the face of the earth, right? Now, do you know the continents? Africa, Asia, Australia, Antarctica, Europe, North America, and South America. Did I say Greenland? Well, Greenland isn't a continent, but it's a huge land mass according to this map, right? The map is a flat out lie, people. If you read the legend on the map, here it says, in fact, South America is actually nine times larger than Greenland. <laughs> now, look at this map. The equator on this map is down here. All the white countries are larger than they should be, and all the countries of people of color are smaller than they should be. This is a visual image that teaches children a lie. In order to make this map anywhere near accurate, you have to take this over here and put it here like this. Now, well, can somebody hold that? Can you hold that down there, somebody? Are you a somebody? Sally is a somebody. Okay, yeah. Sally's a somebody. There. Now, take a look at the difference. Does that give you a different visual image of the importance of the United States? People, there's a, the way you use things like this, teaching aids like this, are what make you and I racist. We were taught that this is the way the world looks. It's a flat out lie. How could a parent not be a racist? How could a white parent not be a racist in a situation in which we do that? I know this, this is like Sunday morning cartoons, but man, I got, like, we got to get down to this, man. We got to get down to this. So Jane Elliott, like Kels was saying, man, I love this little white lady, man, from Idaho or Iowa, man. 
And she created, she did this experiment called the, the blue eye brown eye experiment. Man, if when you got time, just, just look it up on YouTube. Blue eye brown eye experiment. It's mind boggling, right? But um, I, I did that clip to show us that history is really his story, right? So jumping into Jafet. Go uh, flee, Joe Nathan. So uh, after the flood, the sons of Noah spread throughout the land, repopulating the earth. Ham became the progenitor of the dark races, not the Negroes, but the Egyptians, Ethiopians, Libyans, and Canaanites. Shem became the progenitor of the Semitic race, Eber slash Hebrew Abraham. Japheth, meaning God will enlarge, was the progenitor of the Gentile islands, Europe and Asia. Europe and Asia. Uh, history shows that the prophecy of the Japhetic race came to pass with the mass European colonization and colonialism of black and brown nations, as well as the size and number of people in China currently 1.5 billion inhabitants. So in order for us to identify and isolate the seed, the seed, this other seed, we will focus on Noah's first son, Japheth. So this is what day three is about. Now, why wasn't this taught in our books? And you're gonna see what I'm talking about. From traders to bankers, Rothschild meaning red shield, the, per the purchase power of, of, the, of money. And we're gonna dive into the Balfour Declaration and, and Jewish stronghold and the racism in our money too. So like I said, this is the uh, genealogy of Japheth I want us to focus on, right? So Japheth had seven sons, right? Um, his first son was Gomer, and Gomer had Ashkenaz. That was uh, Hebrew for Germany. And on the other side, his fourth son, Javon, <laughs> I'm sounding hood, right? He probably wasn't even Javon, but I'm going to say Javon, had, had Chittim, his third son. Chittim and Ashkenaz joined together to form uh, this, this uh, people called the Khazars. And I don't know if, uh, if Rudolf talk, touched on it, uh, Doc, but uh, the Khazars is what we call Ashkenazi Jewry today, right? And they predominantly in Europe, Palestine, USA. Now, how does this relate to the Bible? So how did Esau, who God hated, become Rome? And it was, I put a little, uh, whatever you call it, a little star on the bottom showing how Esau navigated to uh, through his grandson, Zepho, who, who first tried to partner with Africa, African kings to take over uh, the Hebrew, but then he couldn't do it. So he went to, uh, became king of Rome. And it's in, it's, it's on Wikipedia. Um, his name is Zepho, it was a different name. Um, but this is what I want to touch on, the genealogy of Japheth, which we're never taught in schools. They tell us about Ham, they tell us a little bit about Shem and change his uh, skin color, but they won't talk about Japheth, but I'm gonna talk about it today. And hopefully nobody gets wind of this that uh, control Zoom and cut us off. So traders to bankers, right? And uh, if the powers that be can lie about what Jane Elliott spoke about, it begs the question, what else have they lied about, right? So now looking at this right here, this is how it was in the 10th in the 10th century uh, AD. Um, and Jazz, I didn't tell y'all too. The first 10 copies of my book that went out, um, I made errors mixing AD with BC. And I take full responsibility for it. But one reason I did that is because of the, I mean, God is not the off well, confusion. So before there was BCE and ACE, there was AD and BC. Uh, BC meaning uh, before Christ, AD meaning Anno Domini, Anno Domino, after domination. Somewhere down the line, and you could say atheists did or whatever, they don't like Christ and nothing, right? So somewhere down the line, it transitioned from AD to ACE uh, after Common Era and BCE before Common Era. That, that, that confused me a little bit, but I'm back, but I'm back. But uh, this was the, uh, the religion in the 10th century. There was three major religions. There was a uh, Roman Catholic, not Christianity, Roman Catholic Church. There was Islam, and there was um, uh, Ju uh, Judaism. Now, if you look at the slide on the left, y'all remember the Crusades? Uh, Christians was killing Muslims, right? And then the Muslims was fighting back. 
The Khazars was in the Caucasus Mountains making, making a killing, trading, buying and selling. Now, uh, I believe it was Islam, was both of them, Roman Islam was going to stop trading with the Khazars until they pledged allegiance to either Rome or Islam. Khazar said, we're not going to do either because it's going to mess up our money flow. So what we're going to do is become the next best thing, Judea. Uh, uh, we're going to do Judaism. So this is how this was formed. Now, these, these boys were so good, they ran the whole war. They financed the whole war. They were selling uh, to Rome. They were selling to Islam, and they stayed neutral. So that's why I got a title from Traders to Bankers. Now, the story that I got this from uh, Arthur Kessler's book, uh, The 13th Tribe, because as we all know, there's only 12 tribes uh, of Jacob or Israel. So where does this 13th tribe come from? And I believe Arthur Kessler was genuinely trying to find out what we're trying to find out, who he was. And his research took him somewhere left. His research took him to a what he called the 13th tribe, um, which was European Jewry. That, that we're gonna we're gonna uh, really dive deep into, but the story of the Khazar Empire as it slowly emerges from the past begins to look like the cruelest hoax which history has ever portrayed. So the transition from traders to bankers is where this third slide come from, and I don't know if y'all seen it. Uh, just real quick, anybody seen any of these slides, especially the third slide? I can't see y'all. Can y'all see me? I cause I, I really can't see y'all. Yeah, I can see you. No, I've never seen them, bro. Okay, so uh, now before 9-11, only the following nations in the world were left without a Rothschild-owned central bank. Afghanistan, Iraq, Iran, North Korea, Sudan, Cuba, and Libya. As of today, the only, and this, the 9-11 was with, uh, 20 years ago. As of today, the countries left without a Rothschild bank are Cuba, North Korea, and Iran. What are we doing with those three countries right now? So Sudan, was repeatedly infiltrated by the U.S. in 1956 by President Dwight E. Eisenhower. 1967, they tried to uh, infiltrate Sudan again by uh, Lyndon B. Johnson. Then again in 1972 by President Nixon, and then again 1996. So four attempts to inf put a bank in Sudan was uh, thwarted until it finally was uh, done by Clinton in 96. You can say that Sudan was used to perfect their craft. Now, Afghanistan, invaded by Bush Jr. in 2001. Iraq, two years later, invaded by Bush Jr. in 2003. Libya, invaded by uh, our President Barack Obama in 2011. From 1969 to 2011, Colonel Muammar Gaddafi ruled Libya well. His people loved him. He paid off the country's debt to the central bankers and was moving Libya into a currency backed by gold where America used to be. We were taught through propaganda that Gaddafi was an evil dictator, but you will soon find out that the propaganda is an effective tactic of these Khazar Jews. All right. So if you know any about anything, Netflix has a special and I, and I didn't want to watch it, but I ended up watching it for research purposes about how to become a dictator. And when it spoke about Gaddafi, they couldn't omit the fact that Gaddafi was the longest ruler of a country known to man thus far. 40 years he ruled his people well, 40 years. So for him to be a dictator, I mean, it, it goes deep with Gaddafi, but of course, as we know, Obama came in, uh, killed Gaddafi, guess who's in uh, Libya now? The Central Bank. So um, now that we know their origin, let's find out who these people are. So, Rothschild means red shield. Prior to the defeat, these Khazar Jews perfected a skill known today as international banking, lending to other nations for the conquest of war and control of government. They also acquired a national symbol, the six-pointed hexagram called the Shield of David. Now, what's funny is that the shield or the Star of David is nowhere in the Bible. But what's in the Bible is the Seal of Solomon. The hexagram originally known as the Seal of Solomon, which is the highest form of occult witchcraft. <laughs> We're gonna go deep. We're gonna go deep. So 
Now, uh, that, 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 when, when you read the 13th tribe uh, by Arthur Kessler, and I encourage everybody to get it, it's called the 13th tribe. When you go to chapter part two and chapter six, it's titled, Where From? Section two on page 126 depicts the beginning of the Rothschild dynasty in England. Um, so in 1743, Mayor Amschel Bauer, um, if you can read it, it's, it's kind of blurry, so I'm gonna read it. Uh, Mayor Amschel Bauer, an Ashkenazi Jew, is born in Frankfurt, Germany. He's the son of Moses Amschel Bauer, a moneylender and the proprietor of a counting house. Later on in his life, he became Mayor Amschel Rothschild. And this is one of his famous quotes. I don't know if y'all read it. Let me issue and control the nation's money and I care not who writes the laws. Now, fast forward to his, I think this was his brother or nephew, Nathan Mayer Rothschild. There's a story on him on how he cornered the British market and took trillions from them. And he tells you, and, and he lived to about 55. Maybe they got mad at him and took him out because if you know anything about the occult, it's called hidden knowledge. They like the true power is not on the throne, it's behind the throne. So when you start bragging about the, the hidden hand behind the throne, you got to go. But anyway, Nathan Rothschild made this quote, and you can't take it away. I care not what puppet is placed upon the throne of England to rule the empire on which the sun never sets. That's what England was called back, back in the day, the empire in which the sun never sets. The man who, con this, is, this is Nathan uh, Rothschild, the man who controls Britain's money supply, controls the British empire, and I control the British money supply. And not to go too deep, but America is the daughter of Britain. I want y'all to think about that. America is the daughter of Britain. Uh, my Rothschild, if my sons did not want war, there would be none. Th think about the power we're talking about right now. But just to, just to touch on Nathan real quick, when I'm talking about how he, he owns to this day he owns england his descendants own england and i'm gonna show you how he did it an example of the family's wealth and power is the england slavery abolishment act of 1833 the england slavery abolishing act of 1833 read it on your own time if you can after slavery was abolished in england by the british government nathan mayor rothschild and his brother-in-law moses montefiore agreed to loan Britain 15 million euros. That's $336 billion today. The stimulus package known as the slave compensation did not go to the freed slaves because England did free the slaves first before America. That's why a lot of your plantation owners, slave owners transitioned from England here to the Americas because uh, slavery was abolished there. But the, the money, the $336 billion did not go to the freed slaves, but they went to the newly former slave owners. Taxes, now listen to this, taxes from the working class was used to pay off the loan, which just ended five years ago in 2015. So not only did the British parliament borrow $336 billion from Rothschild, but they used the people to pay the debt off. I ain't gonna touch on our social security and our, and our birth certificates being something like that. But does this sound familiar? If not, let's go deeper into uh, with Mother Rob. But before I switch slides, anybody got something to say about this slide right here? All right, all hearts and minds are clear. Uh, so we're gonna de go deeper into what Ma, Ma Rothschild said. That if our sons didn't want war, there would be none. So let's get into the man, the myth, the legend, Albert Pike. So I stated in day one, I'm gonna discuss Albert Pike. So just a brief synopsis on Pike. Pike, uh, December 29th, 1809 to April 2nd, 1891 was an American author, poet, orator, jurist, and prominent member of the Freemasons. He was also a senior officer of the Confederate States Army who commanded the District of Indian Territory in the Trans-Mississippi Theater of the Americans. So basically, Pike was a commander of the, the rebels. So it, it, it begs, this is why I think we're dying for this lack of knowledge. We have my uncle who's a, who's a Mason. These dudes worship Pike, but do they know who he is? What side he was on? But I'm gonna leave it at that. Pike first joined the Fraternal Independent Order of Odd Fellows in 1840. He next joined the Masonic Lodge where he became extremely active in the affairs of the organization. 
1859, he was elected sovereign grand commander of the Scottish Rites Southern Jurisdiction. That's the highest you can go in uh, Freemasonry. There's the Scottish Rites, which is 33rd degree. The Scottish Rite and um, uh, the other one escaped my mind. The other right on the other side goes to 33 degrees, but it's still the highest you can go is three degrees. It, it's just another form of so-called knowledge attainment, right? But he remained sovereign grand commander for the remainder of his life, a total of 32 years, devoting a large amount of his time to develop the rituals of the order. Now, this is where I really wanted to touch on a pike that we really ain't gonna read in books. So Pike had a trance, right? Um, in 1871, during the Civil War, Pike wrote a letter to an Italian named Giuseppe Mazzini, a revolutionist. In this letter, Pike reveals the Illuminati's plan to bring forth this one world government, AKA New World Order, and claims to have received this vision from a trance, an altered state of consciousness. The plan laid out the events of World War I, World War II, well, not so much World War I, because, uh, yeah, World War One was in yeah, World War One, World War Two, and World War Three. And part of his motivations was seeing how the Civil War was impacted. So let's see here. The First World War must be brought about in order to permit the Illuminati to overthrow the power of the, the Czars in Russia and of making that country a fortress of atheistic com communism. The divergences caused by the agents of the Illuminati between the British and Germanic empires were used to form at this war. At the end of the war, communism will be built and used in order to destroy other governments in order to weaken the religions. Now, if you know anything about World War I, Stalin rose up, created his own, not only USSR, but he, he turned himself a god, got rid of religion. That was the first atheistic uh, government right there. Um, uh, this is why we have to be mindful of these uh, secret society, whether you know it or not, you're operating as a double agent. On the outside, it seems you're loyal to your people and cause, but internally you've taken a higher oath, a blood oath. The Rothschilds had an eternal hatred for Russia from their defeat by Russia and Khazars in, 1960, in 965 AD to the way Russia is today. Um, so the, the Second World War, now this is him predicting the world wars. This is him saying how things is gonna play out. And if you notice what happened in the world wars, they played out exactly how they planned it. So the Second World War played out like this, where there were, of course, it was the fashionists and this is Zionists. And the Zionists was the uh, the Rothschilds, the um, the European Jewry. That's what that was the Zionists. Now, what I wanted to um, focus your attention on is that second sentence: uh, "This war must be brought about that Nazism is destroyed." Now. He wrote this letter, that bring me, bring me up brains real quick. He wrote this letter in 1871 to Giuseppe, right? Nazism didn't come about to what year? I want y'all to think about it. Nazism didn't come, come about to what year? Um, how did Pike know about Nazism in 1871? Hitler didn't come into power until the 1920s and they didn't refer to themselves as Nazis. They were known as the Aryan Brotherhood. So where did the word derive? And what about telling the sovereign state of Israel and Palestine? So I did this little timeline real quick. Uh, 1861 to 60, 1865, the Civil War, right? After that, 1913, the Federal Reserve came about, which began uh, IRS taxation. So the IRS backed the Federal Reserve by taxing us, right? which in the constitution, we wasn't supposed to be taxed anyway. But um, 1914 and 1918 was the uh, World War. Now, let, let me stop there. I, I know this is tough for Saturday morning, but like I'm, I'm, I'm getting somewhere. I'm trying to get us somewhere, but I can't get us to that point without trying to go through this. So if I am going too fast, please stop me. But I, I want us to get somewhere. I want us to get somewhere. So Pike didn't predict this, right? Russia helped the Union thwart off the attack by the South, who was winning the war. So if we know anything about the Civil War, the, the South was winning. They had the best commanders. They had the best generals. They had, they was funded properly by Britain, right? They was, they were, uh, they were, for all intensive purposes, they was winning the Civil War. All of a sudden, Russia came in. 
Russian, uh, the czar Nicholas II came in and supported Abraham Lincoln with, with ships. And all of a sudden, the South lost. Because if you know, if, if you remember history, the, the, the North uh, with their generals, I mean, one of them was a drunk, I believe. So they, the North was all intents and purposes losing the war. So what's funny about that is that um, the Rothschilds, the South was allied with Great Britain and the Rothschild family. Even though the Rothschilds owned England and was funding both sides of the war, they, was, uh, they, they had this mindset on the South winning. Now we love to talk about, and I know you want to uh, touch on this too, uh, Vaughn and uh, Kells. And, and I know uh, a lot of y'all, when we read books, we read about the, uh, the, the, the Middle Passage. Do we ever stop and think why they called it the Middle Passage? That means there was a first and a last passage. We only speak about the ships that went from Africa to America. But do we know them ships started from England to Africa? That was the first passage. And the third passage was back from America back to England. And who, who funded them ships? Who funded them ships? Who had the financial backing to not only fund them ships, but ensure every enslaved American or African-American, so-called African-American that came here? But uh, I'm gonna digress from that. Uh, World War I. Uh, that was with Germany, Austria, Bulgaria, Ottoman Empire. Uh, they fought against Britain, France, Russia, Italy, Romania, and Japan. And, and the United States came in later. Uh, Germany was winning the war against Great Britain uh, due to the invention of the U-boat. So for all intents and purposes, Germany was very uh, advanced. Um, and part of the reason Germany was winning the war in World War I was due to these U-boats, which we call submarines today. Now. Uh, if we know history, Ashkenazis came from Germany. Um, what Arthur, what uh, Arthur Kessler says, after Genghis Khan conquered um, the Khazars, the Khazars became nomads, they migrated to Germany. Uh, Germ Germany let them in, welcomed them in. There was, so, there was more millionaires in Germany. There was more Jew Jewish millionaires in Germany than there was anywhere in the world. Uh, Germany welcomed them in. They controlled the media. They controlled publication. They controlled, by all intents and purposes, Germany. So when Germany was about to win World War One, all 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 the Zionists wanted, all the Rothschilds wanted, was the land of Palestine. That's all they wanted. Germany said, "No, it's not ours to give you." The minute that happened, Germany went to Great Britain. Germany went to Great Britain and reinforced them. And this is where um, the Balfour Declaration come in. And you can read it on your own time. The Balfour Declaration and the Treaty of Versailles really uh, paint a picture of what uh, the books didn't tell us. But the third, the third uh, slot, slot I want to tell you, I remember this in New York Times, and you can't find it no more. Um, the president of Egypt, Gamal Abdel Nasir, he said when he was asked about peace in the Middle East, the late president of Egypt said the Jews will never be able to live here in peace because they left here black, but came back white. Let me, let me ask y'all real quick. Uh, what does that mean to y'all? Like real quick, just cause like I said, I don't want this to be a monologue. I want this to be a dialogue. What does that statement mean to y'all? How does that resonate with y'all? That the Jews left here black and came back white. And he's referring to the 1948, uh, liberation where, where uh, Zionist, Zion, Zionist Jews, uh, Rothschild, they, they acquired the land of Palestine? Well, I'll say, um, I'll say this, that Revelation is like something else. Revelation is something truly special because it's something that's always been there, but it's been hidden from us. Google and the internet and all this stuff and the information and knowledge is running rapid than ever before. And the thing is that's about it, it's like we can up, we, we're uncovering truth faster than they can hide it and cover it up. Right, right. History has been one big, huge hidden lie to, to hide who um, the true people of God truly are. And I struggle with it. Me and you had this conversation a minute, um, you know, for a while. 
I struggled with it for six years. And every time I try to research something to prove it wrong, you know, I prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed that it would that it was wrong. And the more research I did to try to prove it wrong, the more it turned out to be right. So there are so many nuggets across this this worldwide web that are being revealed now. And um, I told I told we had this conversation before that. America, the lies, we, we, we were talking about Christopher Columbus. Right. The, lies of, the lies of the world in America in particular are falling apart. Are falling apart so fast that America don't even know what to do with it. Right. You know what I'm saying? Like the lies are falling apart so fast. The truth is coming out so fast that, you know, it's like a, hit, it's like a magic trick. Well, let's get us let's get them looking at something else so they can stop talking about this. There has yet to be one person on on media when anybody get called out about these fake Jews and stuff like that, or or the blacks being uh, the original people of the Bible. There has yet to be one person to dispute it because right. they know if they if they open up that dialogue like we're doing right now, if this is on mainstream media. And if they open up the dialogue, then everybody, all these floods and all these answers and these questions have to come through. And all I've ever wanted, all I've ever wanted was somebody to dispute what I was finding true. And nobody has ever done it yet. You know what I mean? So that's what it means to me. Like nobody's disputing it. Nobody's even, nobody wants to touch it. No church wants to touch it. No, no Christian station wants to touch it especially no Jewish person wants to touch it because they're coming out saying that they're, they're not the people. Their own rabbis are coming out saying it. So nobody is, it's, it's, you know, it's all over um, YouTube and stuff like that, but it's not on mainstream because nobody wants to touch it because the scary thing is if they're not the original people, then who is? That's even more scarier than them not being the people. <laughs> hey, um, that's all I gotta say. So kind of back to this book that Kyle and I were talking about here from Babylon, Timbuktu. So I remember some, this is my god brother who put me on this and, you know, he was telling me really the origin of the white race, which really came from leprosy. Yeah. So the leprosy is basically a skin condition that zaps pretty much all the melanin out of your skin. All and right. Albinism too. We don't talk about they, albinism. They, they changed, they changed the, um, the definition of it, just like Michael Jackson. They changed, they changed the definition of it, but that was what was leprosy back in the Bible. Mm -hmm. And so this was a part here where if y'all heard of, um, you know, basically what today are Caucasian people are basically the uh, descendants of Gehazi. Yeah, Gehazi. So, yeah. And so I would, and okay, I don't know if you mind here, but I was looking through this book and I was like, man, wait, because this was a perfect time to say this. And it was like, yeah. all right, so Naaman and Gehazi had leprosy. And then they talk about the story. They're like, Naaman was captain of the Syrian army. He acquired leprosy, which we basically talked about. It's like whitening his skin. He right. wanted to be cured. So Naaman wanted to be cured. Then he heard about, um, they called it like Elijah, but they, they kind of, the way they spelled Elisha. it, like Elisha. Yeah, Elisha. Yeah, yeah Elisha. Elisha, yeah. The prophet. So then Elisha told him to dip seven times in the Jordan River. So then Naaman obeyed and he was cured. And then reward was offered to Elisha, but he refused. And then a servant of Elisha, this is Gehazi, basically he wanted the reward that his master Elisha refused. <laughs> so then, see, cheating, right? right. Cheating, deception. Right. Yeah. And we know how that wrote, how that works with some <laughs> of those people, right? Yeah. All right, so then Gehazi ran to look for Naaman. When he found him, he asked him for the reward and said the master had sent him. She lied about it, right? <laughs> he lied. His master Elisha didn't want it. So this, of course, was a lie. When Gehazi returned to Elisha, Elisha said, I know you have gotten garments, olive yards, and all kinds of wealth by means of subterfuge. Deception. Yeah, deception. <laughs> all right. So therefore, the leprosy that Naaman had will cleave unto you and, and unto your seed descendants forever. And he departed from his presence, a leper, as white as snow. This type of leprosy affected the reproductive organs genes and chromosomes that determine hereditary characteristics in his body. This meant all his children will produce white offspring, even though he was a black man at first. <laughs> this right. was the curse of Gehazi. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's crazy too. I read that in that book and uh, 
the Bible gives an earlier instance, and I and and uh, one well, of them examples is Moses. Remember when his sister uh, was mad that Moses married the Ethiopian woman, and uh, he, they were talking junk. It says Miriam and Aaron was talking junk. He God cursed uh, Miriam with white skin. It wasn't this leprosy wasn't disease and that it was just loss of pigmentation. But if you, if you go further back, when uh, when uh, uh, Noah was born, his father uh, said that he looked like an angel, and he wasn't talking about oh, glowing. He was talking about albinism, which we don't speak about. And if you know anything hmm. about albinos, they carry a gene that sometimes it can skip. But that gene resonates. And I say that because of, if Noah had Shem, Shem uh, down the line, Abraham, Abraham and Jacob. And when Jacob had his two kids, uh, not Ishmael, but Jacob had Esau and, and uh, no, no, sorry. When Isaac had uh, Esau and Jacob, they didn't have to describe what Jacob looked like because Jacob looked like everybody in the Bible. But they did describe Esau. Mm. Esau had uh, hairy, hairy skin and he had albinism i believe but huh. yeah that that, that 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 was interesting what you said about rudolph windsor hey, Cal. research on hey, Cal. Cal. Yo. um i don't know if anybody touched on it because i had walked away for a minute but when moses when um moses was uh moses was talking to um god and god told him to put his hand in his bosom and then pull yep. it out and it was white as snow if, he, snow, if, if yeah. Moses was white and he put his hand in his bosom and pulled it out, that would be, still that, be would, white. that wouldn't be anything. You know what I'm saying? That wouldn't be <laughs> even need to talk about it. So if the fact that the fact that he put his hand in his bosom, he pulled it out and it was white as snow and then he put it back and it was regular color. You know what I'm saying? Like it's yeah, all throughout yeah, the Bible, yeah. all these little nuggets. Yeah, that is true. Hey. That's why I think that's why me putting this slide, the third slide on was so uh, prevalent because he was telling you without telling you there would never be peace in the Middle East. There would never be peace in the Middle East because they left black and came back white. And that 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 magazine is gone. That article, that that front page is gone. Yo, that's pretty deep because if you if you remember the leader of Iran, so you can say what you want about him, but he keeps it real. He speaks mm -hmm. truth about who the original people are. And I've seen V just put in um, the book from Dr. Ivan Van Sertima said that speaks to before Columbus, we mm -hmm. were here. Our presence in America way back when, when the original melanated people were already here as well. But to your point, um, if you start, that speak volumes where you talk about um, what they call the Jews. Let's let's go back to its roots, right? We're talking mm -hmm. about <laughs> Hebrews. Yeah. Right? And we know, and you went into Gomar, you talked about Germany, like the people in Israel right now are people from Germany, Russia, all mm -hmm. transplants. And they know the truth. Everybody know the truth around the world. Let's be real. When you go all in Italy, Europe, um, Russia, they all got black Catacombs. people that they pay attention to. Yeah. And nobody wants to talk about it. It's just here in America that we see something that's completely different. And it's because we're trying to keep up the lie. Or well, not us, but yeah. people here, man. And this thing is so deep. Um, it's even in a literature though, right? If you go yep. to the congressional library, like, and you know, it's levels to that thing. You got to be able to know certain things to get to certain levels in that building. Mm -hmm. But when they speak to the original people, when the so-called uh, Spaniards and folk got here, what it looked like here, um, mm -hmm. even down to, uh, and, and this is getting a little off track, but Kyle, when you talk about Europe, right? We can't talk about Europe but unless we talk about, about the, the original Moors. people in Europe, which was the Grimaldi, who was melanated Grimaldi, people. Yep. Wow. So um, this thing is real deep, huge but lie, like, and back the, to true and true. And the crazy thing, it, I'm just touching on a, a, a part of it, right? So I, if you notice what I put in the middle, 1941 and 1945 was the Holocaust, right? 
Now, what if I told you, if you wanted to gain the sympathy of the world, because after World War I, uh, Rothschild still didn't get Palestine. The De Balfour Declaration came out 1917. War was over 1918. Treaties, uh, declarations happened and Zionists still didn't get Palestine. So they had to invoke some type of sympathy in the world that if when they got Palestine, nobody could say anything because they deserved it. It, they needed it. Income, and, and arguably, I know it's gonna rub people, some people the wrong way, but what if you would start something that can invoke some type of sympathy? And in comes the Holocaust. Now, as terrible as the Holocaust was, sympathy for the Jewish race is what the Rothschilds needed in order to acquire Palestine and Israel. And is this too far-fetched? Because remember, we don't spoke about Pike's uh, predictions or or, or or he was in a trance for World War One, World War Two. I didn't talk about World War Three yet. Now, now this is 1871, and if World War One went the way it exactly happened, World War Two went exactly how it happened. It's safe to say World War Three is going to happen the way it is, it is being prophesied now. The Third World War must be fomented by taking advantage of the differences caused by the agitators of the Illuminati between the political Zionists, the leaders of the and the leaders of the Islamic world. The war must be conducted in such a way that Islam, the Muslim Arabic world, and political Zionists, the state of Israel, mutually destroy each other. Meanwhile, the other nations once more divided on this issues because, of course, there was just an article that came out that said a United States, and I don't mean to stop there, but United States churches give over 300, I think it was 300, it was in the billions, give over a billion dollars to, to, um, to Israel because God says those who bless Israel shall be blessed and those who curse. This is the deception now. This is the deception. So other nations is going to become more divided on this issue. Will constrain and fight point of complete physical, moral, spiritual, and economic exhaustion. Just, just, just beat us down till we don't want no more, right? So we shall unleash the nihilists and the atheists, and we shall provoke a formidable social cataclysm, which in all its horror will show clearly the nations the effect of the absolute atheism or origin of savagery and the most bloody turmoil, right? Now, what is a nihilist, right? Now, the, the nihilist is those that a person who believes that life is meaningless, rejects all religions and moral principles. You're going to be beat down so much that you're going to be like, who, who's coming? Just come on, just take me. I don't care who I'm fighting for. And, every, and then everywhere the citizens are obliged to defend themselves. So I don't want to go through all of this, but it, the, the way that uh, the Third World War breaks down and, and, and granular level, how he, he, he projects this, and you see the trajectory the world is going, it, it, I mean, it's safe to say, right? So the, the one thing uh, that was highlighted, um, but without knowing where the horrendous or duration will receive the true light through, the, now this is Pike talking. This is Pike talking. We'll receive the true light through the universal manifestation of the pure doctrine of Lucifer, brought finally out into the public view. This is what he thought. Every book he wrote, this was in mind. So this is what um, the World War III, I believe, is going to be two sides like this. And as you know, this is the uh, U.S. coalition. And right now, you can see Russia, China, Syria, North Korea, and Iran on the other side, right? And what scares me is, is that some people are going to believe the propaganda and jump on the Rothschilds and, and those bloodline families, they're going to jump on them ships and be like, I'm with Israel. I'm with, and you hear it today. And it's such, it's such confusion. It's such confusion and manipulation and the great deception that are we going to be ready? So on the left side, I was sitting there watching TV and this commercial popped up. And I was like, this is how they're going to get us. Let me play this real quick. It's like this a minute. A Tell me if y'all can hear it. Yeah, I can hear it, bro. We care.
will rush an emergency survival package to help one desperate elderly person for a month. Call right now. Call 1-800-936-6536. Do y'all see the title, International Fellowship? Of Christians and Jews? Yes, sir. Now let me get let, let me get this straight. I don't believe, I believe the the Jews, the current Jews right now that's in uh, Palestine. I think they're being deceived too by a, a group of people that's causing a deception. So Christ died for everybody. I believe, right? The blood washes that everybody can be redeemed. But if there's not a an inkling of knowledge of who they are compared to who we are, they're going to be just in the same boat, right? But I just love the fact how. They got billions of dollars going towards Israel, yet they're coming out with commercials like Kathy Southers used to do back in the days, talking about feed the hungry African kids. It just blew my mind. It just blew my mind. And at the end, she said, God says those who bless Israel shall be blessed. It's just a, a level of deception that's going on that I wanted to pinpoint right there in, in that little uh, slide. So uh, now, was, as we was talking about the origins of Ashkenaz uh, being in Germany, uh, this, and I think Kels touched on it too, is in their own literature. So this comes from the Universal Jewish Encyclopedia. The primary meaning of Ashkenaz and Ashkenazim in Hebrew is Germany and Germans. This may be due to the fact that the home of the ancient ancestors of the Germans is media. Is media, which is the biblical Ashkenaz. Cross is on the opinion that in the early medieval ages, the Khazars were sometimes referred to Ashkenazim. About 92% of all Jews are approximately 14.5 million are Ashkenazim. Now, I wanted to highlight uh, the Germans, another word for German or, or Ashkenaz is media. Now, nobody, we never asked where that word come from, but remember Hitler and his crew never referred to others as Nazis. I was asking you where the Albert Pike get that word Nazi from. He got it from the word Ashkenazim. If you wanna hide something from a nigga, put it in a book. When I hide stuff from my kids, I hide it in plain sight. And I, truth be told, they'll go past it a hundred times a day and won't even see it. The word Nazi, he came out with this word Nazism in 1871. Hitler didn't become the power in 1920, but they referred to themselves as uh, the Aryan uh, race or Aryan Brotherhood. Um, so, so they call themselves Aryan. So it's the same place the word media derived from. Um, Ephesians 2 2, where in the time past you walked according to the course of the world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Satan is called the prince of the power of the air. So, who controls this? Let's take a look at the segment of our media, the music industry. So, music is so powerful. Lucifer was the leader of music in heaven, so it's only natural he used that same heavenly knowledge in the earth. In one of his interviews, the Houston rapper Scarface stated hip-hop is being controlled and manipulated by white Jewish record labels. Remember the movie Straight Outta Compton? Who was Easy es manager? Jerry Heller. This was the start of gangster rap and the end of conscious rap. Guess who manages most of our Black comedians? Michael Rottenberg has been managing Chris Rock since 1996. Now, Christian artists may be unaware or signed to these labels. Artists like Lecrae. This is why most artists, both secular and Christian, fight to stay independent like Bizzle and uh, what's his name that died? Uh, he had the Marathon store. You know what I'm talking about? Was he, he he had died uh, in Cali. Yeah, when Nipsey Hussle. Nipsey Hussle. Nipsey Hussle. Remember, he was trying to stay independent. And right before he died, I think he signed to a label. But they was trying hard to stay independent. I won't even touch on the movie industry and their subliminal messaging initiative called White Savior Narrative. Um, now, with the White Savior Narrative, it's a real thing. It's, in, it's ingrained into every script you read in Hollywood. What the White Savior Narrative does is any Black movie you come out with that has, even if it's fact or fiction, there has to be a White Savior. A good example of that was Taraji playing in Hidden Figures. 
I don't know if y'all remember Ke uh, Kevin Kevin Costner's role. That didn't exist. Uh, which is uh, Mahalia, my, my, my uh, the dude Mahalia that played in uh, Luke Cage. Y'all know who I'm talking about, right? Um, he played in uh, The Green Book. His white driver, Viggo Mortensen, that didn't exist. But they have to put implement a white savior to keep that subliminal message in happening. Well, okay, Cal, and something else that I just like thought about, right? Even, um, you know, the, the, so the movie, there's actually a couple examples came up to mind. So, like, the help, remember the, the young white chick that was like, the, she was going to be like a newspaper reporter or something like that. <laughs> and they tried to make her sound like she was all great. And I guarantee you that shit didn't exist. And then even, <laughs> even Black Panther. They had yep, like yep, that middle aged white dude man that was flying and shit too. And so, yep. and everybody was like so great about Black Panther. I mean, rest in peace to Chad with Bozeman. I mean, he's great, but honestly, everybody was so loving that movie. I thought Black Panther honestly was pretty mediocre. <laughs> like, I didn't really want to say it, but like, because everybody was so excited about it, I'm just like, but then when I watched it, I was like, okay, yeah, that's some good messages in the movie. But then what did they do? They actually had group of black people pitting against each other. Yeah. <laughs> And then they had the white savior come in and fly in the little yeah. UFO looking shit. There's a lot of movies out there like <laughs> and that. And I'm so telling funny. you, and everybody celebrates this shit, but I was just like, I'm not really impressed, you know? So anyway, yeah. I had to bring that up. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was good. That was good. So the, this slide right here, it brings up every, this is the rap, this is hip hop. You are looking at hip hop. So up in the top left, that's uh, The Weeknd. Uh, with Lucian Grange, C president and CEO of Universal Music Group. With Mary J. Blige, you got Zach Horowitz, CEO of Universal Music Publish Group. On the bottom, you have, uh, I believe that's Stephen F. Cooper, CEO of Warner Music Group. To your right, everybody know about Dr. Dre, but do you know who was behind him? Jimmy Levine, Ashkenazi Jimmy Levine. They sold beats to Apple for billions. Got broke off. Childish Gambino, you see who's with Childish Gambino? Uh, Rob Stringer. I don't know that artist right there that's with uh, the other one, John Janik, but he's the CEO of Interscope Records. Now, Rick Rubin, we all grew up on uh, Run DMC and Def Jam, and we thought Russell Simmons was CEO, of, founding CEO of Def Jam, but it was Rick Rubin. The same Rick Rubin that was in Jay-Z's video, 99 Problems, but a bitch ain't one, right? And on the bottom, you have uh, Steve Bartles. So, and it's, 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 it's many more. I just, I couldn't fit them all in my slide. I couldn't fit them all in my slide. But the same people who own and operate these companies own percentages in the prison industrial insured, in prison industrial complexes. Do you see yeah. profit on both sides? Go ahead, Vaughn. Yeah. I, I, see, I see parallels and comparisons that, white people usher in black people. Mm. And that's 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 historic as well. Um, you look at anything that we do from religion to voting, it, a white person is ushering black people in. So this is kind of parallel to the history of America. White people mm. are ushering black people in. But not just ushering them, but owning them. Yeah, oh, to usher, to, you know, to usher is to lead the way, you know. So you got that. They've been, they the been leading the way, hmm. and we've been following because if it's about capitalism, they are who the ones who created capitalism, so they are the leaders, right? So we mm -hmm. do what they say, like Kelly was saying in the subconscious mind, whether. We want to believe it or not, whether we unaware of it or conscious of it, we do what they say. Mm. And but un, un, unbeknownst to us, though, right? Because it's it's the hidden hand. So it, it blew my mind when I found out that the NAACP was given to blacks, and it was given to blacks by uh, um, what was his? It was it was it was uh, one of them was a. Uh, uh, a known Jewish billionaire, um, given it, he, he gave it to uh, W.E.D. Du Bois and some others. But we think when we see him in the videos and, and, and the songs, we think 
that they're for us. But what if they is operating off that same title, keep your, in your friends close and your enemies closer because they know who we are. You understand what I'm saying? It, it, it's, it's so paramount. But what I wanted to show this, because I'm going to this other slide that shows how not only did they bring, eliminate uh, conscious rap, but brought in gangster rap through NWA and some of them West Coast rappers, but who did it? And why did they do it? Hey, and Cal, hey, so I think the guy's name, I can't, I forgot his first name, but I think his last name is Spingarn. Mm -hmm. I think he was the Jewish guy, because like I said, NAACP went in created by black people. It was, no, it was Jerry, it was Jerry Heller. He was no, 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 I'm talking about the NAACP. Oh, NAACP. I, yeah, I got his name that's last name is Spingarn. And I forgot his first name, but like the NAACP went in created by black people, was created by Jewish people. Yep. But yep. really and truly, if you look back at it, it's like, our stuff has been infiltrated forever, man. And that group of people where they like try to infiltrate our shit, the NAACP has been infiltrated. Um, some people tell you the whole thing with even like Rosa Parks when she when they staged that thing in the back of the bus or whatever her plenty of people mm -hmm. were doing that shit way before her but she was the secretary of the NAACP and they straight up orchestrated that shit so like right. so that was that some people even say that MLK was a plant until until he was talking about cut us that damn check and then that's when they yeah, so him. He, he was Michael <laughs> King when he was that plant or that agent he was Michael King Jr. right and mm -hmm. then he, his dad changed his name when he was nine years old to Martin Luther King because his dad went on, um, uh, what do you call those things? Like a mission trip. Yeah. And he learned about Martin Luther. Came back, changed his name and changed his son's name. So, but for all intents and purposes, MLK lived as Michael King for a long time as a gatekeeper for the boule until he became a martyr. He, he, he got, he woke up to really what was going on. And now we remember him as MLK and I'm fine with that, but we need to say the whole story because he becomes more credible when you learn Michael King became Martin King. But that's that's another story, right? Yeah. But I just wanted to make that caveat that this is not about bashing a certain race. It's about enlightening us and it just so happened to bring another race to light, but we got to speak on it. And I, I hate the fact that you had somebody like... Um, uh, what's his name? Got a radio show now. Nick Cannon. They turned him into a buck. He was he was he went, he was on he was on he, he invited pro pro Professor Griff to his show, and he looked like he was waking up, and then they 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 all of a sudden he making babies. All of a sudden he's being remembered in the media as having all these kids and stuff like that. They turned him into a buck, and it's so sad that this was happens to us. They got to squash us at every level. But the thing is, though, I will say this about Nick Cannon, man. I hate to say this, man. I never took him seriously. Like, when he was on that super, like, militant shit, I was like, this is Nick fucking Cannon. This dude's a fucking goofball, <laughs> man. I was just like, he ain't going to stay true to this shit. And then when faced with pressure, he broke like I thought he would. So I was like, man, I already knew that was going to happen. So I, I ain't have any faith in Nick Cannon. So please. I, <laughs> I, was, I wasn't really mad at that. I mean, it's Nick Cannon. It's Nick Cannon. crazy. <laughs> But if you remember, he was coming out with the Netflix with Dr. Sabi. Where is that at? Where, they knew what he, this is. He didn't, he didn't play it smart, man. Nick Cannon, Nick Cannon too goofy, man. He didn't play that shit smart. He see, now, if he was like Dave Chappelle, see. Yeah. <laughs> we ain't going to never see it. We ain't going to never see that Nick oh, nah. Sabi uh, special on that. We ain't going to never see it. Well, you, you got to go back to the core, what you started off with. For I only like using the word for Jew because ain't no J in the house, Hebrew alphabet. But... <laughs> When we get to it and we start about who controls the media, every last outlet is controlled by Jews. Yep. And so they only gonna let you get what they want in their atmosphere. And you know what I mean? When you think every time a person of color has tried to buy a major network, somebody disappeared, somebody died, yep. or they go going to prison. Yep. Like this thing is real. Um, and, and it's the same four families they're not even, it's not just the United States control the freaking world. Mm. Mm. This is and, deep. And, 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 and they, more importantly, you see how they profiting on both sides. Ever since, I wanted to draw that parallel when you, I showed this, the slide of the Khazars in the middle, Roman Catholics on the left, Islam on the right. They became Jews to, to still keep that money going. Fast forward to today, you got the music industry on the left, 
industrial prison complex on the right. Insta rap is fueling this. So who is this picture on the top? The Lehman Brothers. I don't know if y'all uh, ever heard of the Lehman Brothers, but they were three Jewish brothers who migrated from Germany to uh, Montgomery, Montgomery, Alabama from 1844 to 1847 and opened a dry goods store. In 1854, the brothers began purchasing slaves. By 1855, they controlled the cotton trade industry in Montgomery. When cotton trading began to shift from the South to the North, the Lehman Brothers opened up their first branch in 1858 in the heart of New York City. Before the mortgage crisis hit in 2008, which I was a part of, Lehman Brothers Holding Incorporated was the fourth largest investment bank in the US. That's over 158 years of enslaving, trading, and banking and insuring. Lehman Brothers history has largely, has largely ignored the fact that the company has been one of the largest, most consistent financial backers of the private prison industry. From the late 1990s to the fall in 2008, Lehman Brothers supplied billions of dollars in capital and credit to for-profit private prison firms such as CCA, the GOO, the GEO, the Cornell Corrections, while at the same time providing those companies with a safety net. So if the prison, if that industrial prison complex was failing, they would infuse money into them to keep them going because you're going to get your black inmates soon. Just hold on. Hold on a little bit. You're going to get your black inmates soon. The same people that impoverish blacks by redlining loans, forbidding black soldiers to receive a GI Bill, infusing crack cocaine into our neighborhoods with the CIA, then in reinforcing distribution of drugs by way of gangster rap in order to increase poverty and imprisonment, these brothers ensured the, and held partial ownership of the prison industrial complex. Can you see the pattern? Financially benefiting from both sides of the war. So the Lehman Brothers, man, if you, if you read them, they wasn't the only uh, Jewish migrants that left uh, Germany, Russia area and came to the South and came to the South Made, made millions, made millions off of lending, borrowing and trading us. So this right here is just another slide of, of others. So you not know, this ain't no damn conspiracy. And if it is, uh, it's a confederacy, right? But this is a group of people that's intentionally doing this. This is not happenstance, this is not a mistake. These are, uh, and, we, and the effort trying to enlighten us, this is just coming to pass. It just how it is, this is just how it is. But these are uh, these is Ashkenazi Jews that own Time Warner, that own Disney, that own Viacom, which is, uh, I think Viacom is MTV, Comedy Central, and now BET. They own, I mean, just look. Now, like, uh, I wanted to get into, I know in the beginning I told you about uh, racism being in the corners. So I remember being younger. I was then my, like 10 years old in New York. I used to sit on my stoop and a postman, black man, he used to come. And at a young age from like, I was nine till I was 13, he was just instilling me the stuff. I'm talking about 1990s. And this is one of the things he instilled with me that I remember to this day. If you look at the coins, what's wrong? Like you got Abraham Lincoln on one side and you got the, uh, what is that? Washington, I think that's Eisenhower and I think that's Jefferson uh, on the nickel. Well, just tell me what do y'all see? I start off the color. What do you see in the color? I mean, you got the copper, which is of course the penny, which is the least. And I mean, really, and they even said in the Bible, like, really, God's or Jesus' skin was really of copper. <laughs> well, that's just kind of what just popped in my mind. And they're trying to minimize that. That's, I don't know. <laughs> that, like, like also, uh, and that's, that's, that's a lot too, right? Like, the copper is, is trying to show that I think because they own the money, and this is just me, because they own the money, they had the right to turn him the same color as us. Burnt, burnt like brass. And, and I think it has a lot to do with how Lincoln emancipated and won the North. Um, mm -hmm. And then on, on the bottom of that, they turned their back on Lincoln too. And this is a, this shows their, their hatred, the, 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 their vengeance on this thing. 
Esau would never let Jacob go. Would never let Jacob go. And if you, we all know about the dollar where we at now. If you look at the back of the dollar, you're talking about, uh, I think it says uh, Nuvio Seculos, um, uh, anywhere, new, new secular order. Um, it's just so much embedded into it. But for the sake of time, uh, we got 10 minutes left. Um, I just wanted to touch on some of this stuff. Uh, subliminal messaging, Satan, race, and religion is engrafted into our money. In the 1990s, um, this was when it was first brought up to my attention. Um, now, who do you know? Well, let me put it this way. After you look at the money and you look at the power they have to, to, to form the money how they choose to, you got to take it to the Federal Reserve, right? Now, if you look at the Federal Reserve, it's not a government institution. Uh, the Federal Reserve, it has stockholders that yield the 6% annual dividend on taxes be paid. Um, the crazy thing about the Federal Reserve is that this is 30 years of Jewish control um, fed. There has been never been a minority that ran the Federal Reserve. Never been a minority. Um, I just I just wanted to uh I just wanted to shed some of this light and uh just make sure that what we're doing is is walking with a, a purposeful state of mind. That's that's the main thing I wanted to touch on that we walk walking with a purposeful state of mind and just just notice certain things that's happening with us. And I hope I, I, I did right by y'all. Um I have I I have a, I wanted to show y'all like, you know how movies do sneak peeks and sneak previews. I wanted to show y'all like a sneak preview real quick of, of day four. Um, but I want to also discuss it and, and just find out which, which I think about uh, everything that we read. And then maybe um, when 11 o'clock comes, if y'all still want to stay on there, I created like a, a, a short clip of the, from a secular point of view of the banking industry. It's about, it's not short, it's actually 10 minutes, but this is, I know we do it a lot after UGB is over. Some of us linger by and then we watch and then we talk and then discuss. So I wanted to play a video and some that have to go, go ahead, but some that can stay, go, yeah, feel free to stay and watch uh, that video. Hold on, uh, Cal, but, oh, Cal, before you show it, I, I, I do want to say that. No, if, no, I was going to show it right away. No, 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 no. I was going to say if brothers want to stay on, that's cool. I got I to gotta head to a funeral. And so I just want to say, brothers want to stay on after eleven. That's that's cool. I'll just keep I'll, I'll keep everything going. Okay. Uh, and uh, this is I, I just wanted to show this short uh, uh, preview to day four. Um, touching into like uh, like Que said, if they ain't the people, then who is? And from the mouth from the mouth of the person, it, it, it's more credible of saying of of admitting. That hey, you got to look into this DNA thing. So I just wanted to show that, and then we could we could do some chopping up and talking. Oh, hold on, let me see here. Can y'all see it real quick? Let me see here. And I'm just gonna show that quick video. Hold on. And I'd like to now bring up another interesting place that you're finding descendants of the Israelites, but may not necessarily be from the ten tribes, but will also play a role, and shouldn't be overlooked. It's a very serious scenario. Is is in Africa. Africa has perhaps hundreds of millions of people with this identity right now of being from the people of Israel. Does that mean they were from the Ten Tribes? Likely not. We were taught by the historians and within our own traditions that when the Romans conquered Judea a few hundred years after that the tribes of Israel went into exile, perhaps millions of Judeans were sold into slavery, into Africa, into Rome, deep into Africa, and if you look now, you're seeing people who are most likely the descendants of those slaves who kept true. I'd like to bring up a few specific examples because they're going to be game changers. One of them wrote letters to Israel when it became a state. And they said, we're, uh, we're Israelites out in Africa. You know, everyone laughed at them and they said, African Israelites... These people are just trying to jump on the first world country bandwagon. They're living in a third world country. They got nothing. We're coming to Israel. We got innovation, technology. So they're trying to get on this train because there's such a thing called the right of return. All descendants of the Jewish people from around the world are able to move to Israel. So they, they said we are also. 
And everyone kind of laughed at them, like I said. And a few people took it serious and went out there and started studying them, learned about their culture. And a professor from Duke University went out there and did DNA testing on them. And he showed not only do they share Semitic genes from people who were in Yemen and back to the Middle East, these gentlemen, a large percent of them, have the Y chromosome to be Kohanim, to be priests. Now, if anyone who doesn't know, a priest is a specific family clan of the nation of Israel who come from Aaron, the brother of Moses, who was the first priest. And anyone descended from Aaron is, has the, the, the status title priest. And we found that these men in this village in South Africa called Lemba, L-E-M-B-A, carry this genetic marker to let us know that they share the same as from the Svartic and the Ashkenaz and, and the population of the people in Israel today, they share the same exact DNA marker. That's mind-blowing. So everyone kind of got humbled a little bit who, who laughed at them and said, now, now, now what? Now what do we do about this? This could have tremendous implications. Another area in Africa you have uh, something big happening is in Nigeria. You have the Igbo people, or Igbo, pronounced either way. There's 40 million of them, also Christians, like I spoke about before, how that could happen to the children of Israel very easily. But also a lot of them are now coming out and converting back or adopting the, the rules of the Torah without all the paganism that they've been practicing for hundreds of years. There's been books written about it from scholars in Nigeria, from scholars from the Jewish people. And where it gets interesting is, in America, there was a slave trade. And a lot of the slaves, a very high percentage of them, came from Western Nigerian ports. And in America today, you see a, a very large movement of African Americans who say that they're the real chosen people, that they're the children of Israel, they're the Judeans. You know, so what, are they just trying to create a, an identity for themselves because they were slaves, or is there really something here? And the answer is, most likely there is something there. And most likely, maybe that they were the original Israelites, and maybe that the Jewish people today who are white Caucasian people um, came in a little bit later on. We know that some of the greatest sages of the transmission of the Torah were converts from Rome. That was a dude falling out of his feet. You have a man named Unculus who, who wrote a commentary on the Torah, unprecedented, that we still learn today. He was a convert. Some of the largest pillars on the transmission today were Roman converts. So here we are, we're, you know, I'm speaking, we're ca Caucasian Jewish people. And now you have people in Africa saying that they're the real people of Israel. It can't be ruled out at all. We know they were sold into slavery. We know now that they're fulfilling prophecies by saying, we're coming back. Now, did y'all see the uncomfortability on that man? Did y'all see the uncomfortability on that man? <laughs> but, like, that's, that's part four. Like, like it, it goes deep into what he said. If they ain't them, then who is? And, yeah. But, like, uh, I just wanted to thank y'all ten, for 1058, Jazz. I just wanted to thank y'all, brothers, man. Just uh, I know it was a lot on a Saturday morning, but I just wanted to thank y'all, brother. And I hey. and I open it up and we we chat. Hey, Cal, did you say that somebody like in that crowd fell out of their seat? Or did something? you hear it? I always say that. Every time I hear it, it sounds like somebody fell out this seat. Like <laughs> they, they were like, "Oh Lord." <laughs> his, name is, uh, his name is Rabbi Harry Rosenberg. He's the co-founder of Lost Tribes Beverage and Theological Research Institute and co-finder of iTribe, a social network mapping out of the lost tribes of Israel. Uh, see, what's going on is these dudes is like, they getting hungry like us. But what they discover it is not what they were told. You understand what I'm saying? And it's, and it's shocking people like to the core. And he's like, well, maybe they are. Well, we we got to say something. You can't deny them. As, as, as uncomfortable as he was, he couldn't deny this stuff. And you're seeing a lot and a lot more of it. You're seeing a lot, 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 lot more. But uh, I thank y'all, brothers, man. Thank y'all for enduring with me. I know it was, it was like Jazz said, it was heavy for a Saturday morning. Um, but like, uh, y'all good? 
Everybody's good, man. All right, yeah, so I'm going to say, say a quick prayer. And uh, that one, we could chop it up. And for those who want to stay behind, I play that video on the banking industry, the modern day banking industry from a secular level. Um, not from a biblical level, but from a secular level and see how white people is like, what the heck is going on here, man? This is wrong, right? It, it, it's, it's very funny video, man. But uh, if, if all hearts and minds are clear, I say a quick prayer, man. Uh, Father, in the name of Jesus, we just thank you, Lord. We honor you. We praise you as Lord and Savior, Lord. We thank you that uh, as sin abound, grace does much more, Brandon. We thank you for your mercy that you're enlightening us like this. You are opening the books up and giving us this stuff so we can not only uh, edify ourselves, but edify others who's, who, who has an ear to hear. And I thank you for all the brothers that's on here now and that was on here and had to go. I pray traveling mercies on their life. I pray a hedge of protection over every each and every brother and their family. Uh, remind us, Father, that we are prophet, priest, and king, and that uh, we set the tone. We are the uh, thermostat and not the thermometer. In Jesus' name, amen. So look, I, I've been on this hard. I'm going to go pee, right? And uh, y'all can watch the video, right? And, and, and stick around if y'all want after the vid. But I'm just going to play this real quick, and then I'm uh, we're going to come back. If y'all still here, we'll chop it up. Hold on. Let me see. Here. Slide. here we go. You are about to learn one of the biggest secrets in the history of the world. It's a secret that has huge effects for everyone who lives on this planet. Most people can feel deep down that something isn't quite right with the world economy, but few know what it is. Gone are the days where a family can survive on just one paycheck. Every day it seems things are more and more out of control, yet only one in a million understand why. You are about to discover the system that is ultimately responsible for most of the inequality in our world today. The powers that be do not want you to know about this, as this system is what has kept them at the top of the financial food chain for the last 100 years. Learning this will change your life because it'll change the choices that you make. If enough people learn it, it'll change the world because it'll change the system. For this is the biggest hidden secret of money. Never in human history have so many been plundered by so few, and it's all accomplished through this, the biggest scam in the history of mankind. It all starts here with the banks. It all starts when some politician says, vote for me and I'll make sure the government provides you more free stuff than my opponent will. But there's no such thing as a free lunch. So to provide that supposedly free stuff, the politicians vote for the country to spend more than its income. This is called deficit spending. To pay for that deficit spending, the Treasury borrows currency by issuing a bond. The Treasury then holds a bond auction, and the world's largest banks show up and compete to buy part of our national debt and make a profit on it by earning interest. You'll notice that as we move through this process, the big banks are there taking a cut every step of the way. This isn't by chance, as you'll see shortly. Then, through a shell game called open market operations, the banks get to sell some of those bonds to the Federal Reserve at a profit. To pay for the bonds, the Federal Reserve opens up its big old checkbook and writes bad, bogus, counterfeit checks that should bounce because they're drawn on an account that always has a zero balance, there isn't one penny in there. To quote from the Boston Federal Reserve, when you or I write a check, there must be sufficient funds in our account to cover that check. But when the Federal Reserve writes a check, there is no bank deposit on which that check is drawn. When the Federal Reserve writes a check, it is creating money. The Treasury issues IOUs, bonds. The banks then buy those IOUs with currency. The Federal Reserve then writes IOUs, checks, and hands them to the banks in exchange for the Treasury's IOUs, the bonds. And currency is created. So what's really happening is the Federal Reserve and the Treasury are just swapping IOUs, using the banks as middlemen, and abracadabra, presto, currency magically springs into existence. This process repeats and repeats over and over again, enriching the banks and indebting the public by raising the national debt. The end result is that there's a buildup of bonds at the Federal Reserve and currency at the Treasury. This process is also where all paper currency comes from. Money has to be a store of value and maintain its purchasing power over long periods of time. 
We learned in episode one that earlier in our history, our paper currency was just a claim check. It was a representation for real money of intrinsic value, the gold and silver that was held on deposit at the treasury. You could walk into any bank and slap your currency, like say a $20 bill on the counter and redeem it for real money, a $20 gold piece. But now this base currency that's piling up back here is really nothing but a receipt or a claim check on an IOU, that bond. So it's really nothing but a supply of numbers. The Treasury then deposits the newly created currency into the various branches of the government, and the politicians say, hey, thanks for that. And the government does some deficit spending on public works, social programs, and war. The so once again, when currency is deposited in the banks, the banks get to lend it out, and then it gets redeposited and relent, redeposited and relent, redeposited and relent over and over again, creating bank credit all the way. This is where the vast majority of our currency supply comes from. In fact, 92 to 96 percent of all currency in existence is created not by the government, but here in the banking system. Now, if you thought that was crazy, get ready to enter the twilight zone of modern economics. We work for some of that currency supply. True wealth is your time but we trade away moments of our lives, hour by hour, day by day, and year by year, for numbers that somebody printed on pieces of paper or just typed into a computer. Now those numbers represent our blood, sweat, tears, labor, ideas, and talent. We are what gives the currency its value. But here comes the really cruel joke. We work hard so that we can save some of that currency so that we can pay the tax collector in the United States, it's known as the IRS. They then turn it over to the Treasury so that the Treasury can pay the principal plus interest on that bond that the Federal Reserve bought with a check drawn on an account that has nothing in it. Now let's do a recap on this section because this is where the system begins to rob you and I on a massive scale. Much of our taxes are not used for schools, roads, and public services, but to pay interest on bonds that the Federal Reserve bought with a check drawn on an account that has nothing in it. The Federal Reserve is committing fraud. But here's one of the biggest secrets of them all. Before the establishment of the Federal Reserve, there was no need for personal income tax. The Federal Reserve was created in 1913 and that very same year, the Constitution was amended to allow income tax. Do you really think this was just a coincidence? Ask yourself how much income tax you've paid over your lifetime. Much of it has been silently siphoned away into the hands of those who own the system. Yes, this system has owners. Who they are is an even bigger secret that we'll get to shortly. The Founding Fathers of the United States knew the dangers of central banking and fought to free themselves from this very thing. The Revolutionary War started out as a tax revolt, but now we must pay tax just to have a monetary system. Having just suffered through the hyperinflation of the continental dollar, which was printed into oblivion to finance the Revolutionary War, they understood the dangers of fiat currency and debt-based monetary systems. So to protect future generations from institutional theft and out-of-control government, they wrote into the Constitution that only gold and silver can be money for the simple fact that you can't print them. Our current system is not only unconstitutional, but it robs us of the liberty and prosperity our forefathers fought and died for. We are all feeling the effects of ignoring the Constitution right now. By forcing more currency into circulation, our purchasing power is diluted. Inflation is a slow and insidious stealth tax that is simply the result of this debt-based monetary system. This system empowers and benefits those who create the currency and receive it first, as they get to spend it into circulation before it has an effect on the economy. They're stealing purchasing power from you and transferring it to the banks and the government every hour of every day because of this false monetary system. And it's not like the people at the top don't know this. To quote the Federal Reserve, the decrease in purchasing power incurred by the holders of money due to inflation imparts gains to the issuers of money. This is a fraud. It is a pyramid scheme. It is a Ponzi scheme. It's a scam and it's a lie. 
Our entire monetary system is nothing but a form of legalized theft. But here's the biggest con job of them all. The Federal Reserve is not federal, it has stockholders. There is no federal agency that has stockholders. What's a stockholder? A share of stock represents a percentage of ownership in a corporation. So the stockholders are the owners of that corporation. Therefore, the Federal Reserve is a private corporation with owners. And you can see it for yourself if you go to the Federal Reserve's website, and it will say, the stockholders receive an annual dividend of 6%. Now we know that the stock in the Federal Reserve was originally issued to the largest banks in the United States. But because of mergers and acquisitions through the years, you can't actually trace who owns the stock in the Federal Reserve. That's a very closely guarded secret. My guess would be that the owners are those primary dealers, the banks that get to make a profit by selling part of our national debt, those bonds, to the Federal Reserve, who buys them with a check from nothing. Then we pay tax to pay the principal and the interest on those bonds so that the Federal Reserve can pay the banks a 6% dividend. Don't be alarmed if you don't quite comprehend the deception of this system at first glance. Very few people do. It is purposely complex. The economist John Maynard Keynes once wrote, by this means, government may secretly and unobserved confiscate the wealth of the people, and not one man in a million will detect the theft. I believe that presented correctly, anyone can understand this system, regardless of how complex it is. So let's do a recap and break it down even more. The way the system works is that, step one, the government creates glorified IOUs. These bonds increase our national debt and put the public on the hook to pay it back. Step two, IOUs are swapped to create currency. The treasury sells the bonds to the banks. The banks then turn around and sell our national debt at a profit to the Federal Reserve, which they probably own. The Federal Reserve then opens its checkbook that doesn't have a penny in it and buys those IOUs with IOUs that it writes, checks on a checking account that has a zero balance. Then they give those checks to the banks and currency just springs into existence. And then the whole process repeats. This results in a buildup of bonds at the Federal Reserve and currency at the Treasury, which is really just a supply of numbers. The Treasury then deposits the numbers in the various branches of the government and we get to step three. The government spends the numbers on promises, public works, social programs, and war. Then the government employees, contractors, and soldiers deposit their pay into the banks. And we get to step four, where the banks multiply the numbers by magically inventing more IOUs through fractional reserve lending, where they steal a portion of everyone's deposit and lend it out. That currency gets redeposited and then a portion is stolen again. And the process repeats over and over, magnifying the currency supply exponentially. Then we work for some of those numbers, which brings us to step five, where our numbers are taxed. We pay tax to the IRS, who then turns our numbers over to the Treasury, so the Treasury can pay the principal plus the interest on bonds that were purchased by the Federal Reserve with a check from nothing. Then we get to step six, the debt ceiling delusion. The system is designed to require ever-increasing levels of debt and will eventually collapse under its own weight because politicians always kick the can down the road. They don't want it to collapse on their watch. And finally, step seven, the secret owners take their cut. The world's largest banks own the Federal Reserve. Those banks make a profit selling our national debt to the Fed. They make a profit when the Fed pays them interest on the reserves held at the Fed. And the Fed pays them a 6% dividend on their ownership of the Fed. This system is fundamentally evil. It funnels wealth from the working population to the government and the banking sector. It is the cause of the artificial booms and busts of modern economies, and it causes great disparity of wealth between the rich and the working class. And it is only possible because we no longer use real money, we use currency. But worst of all, it is a form of enslavement. Bond is the root word of bondage. Whenever a government issues a bond, it is a promise to make us pay tax in the future. Nobody asked you if you wanted to pay tax today for the prosperity we all enjoyed in the last century. Nobody is asking our children if they want to work hard in the future 
to pay for the prosperity we're enjoying now. George Washington once wrote to James Madison, no generation has the right to contract debts greater than can be paid off during the course of its own existence. By stealing prosperity from tomorrow so we can spend it today, we enslave ourselves and future generations. Now this all sounds pretty bad, but there is great hope, for you are the greatest threat to this false monetary system. This system relies on the public being ignorant of its workings. Please share this knowledge with everyone you know, because an informed public that fully understands the system can build a better future for generations to come. And now I leave you with this quote, widely attributed to a former director of the Bank of England. The modern banking system manufactures money out of nothing. The process is perhaps the most astounding piece of sleight of hand that was ever invented. Banking was conceived in inequity and born in sin. Bankers own the earth. Take it away from them, but leave them the power to create money and control credit, and with the flick of a pen, they will create enough money to buy it back again. But if you want to continue as the slaves of bankers and pay the cost of your own slavery, let them continue to create money and to control credit. This is the Federal Reserve in Washington, D.C. It's located on Constitution Street, and that is just as much of a joke as the New York Fed being located on Liberty Street. Both of them are unconstitutional, both of them limit our liberty, and they transfer wealth away from us every second of every day to the Federal Reserve, to the government, and to the banking sector. You are now among the one in a million who can detect the theft of your prosperity. So the big question is, what can you do about it? One, watch this video until you can describe and teach it to others. Those who understand this system can make preparations for its unavoidable collapse and protect themselves. History shows that those who don't will probably be wiped out. Two, share this video with everyone especially those you care about. All it takes is a mouse click or two to get this message in front of millions. Post this video on Facebook, tweet it, email it to loved ones. Please share it wherever you can. Three, join the conversation. The current world monetary system is based on a 300-year-old design meant to enrich a few at the expense of the many. There must be a better way. Hey, Cal, man, where'd you find that video, man? That that was very lightning. I took a screenshot of that last one that he had that kind of drew it out because, man, it is all, it's all scam, man. Yeah, look, I, I believe Bernie Madoff knew what happened and he created his own Ponzi scheme. You, did you, you know what I mean? Because that's yeah. what exactly what that was, a Ponzi scheme. But I can, I can send, matter of fact, what I could do, I, I still got the link. I, let me see if I can put it in here. Yeah. I put it. I put it in UGB the link because I had to chop it up because it's actually like longer than that. But man, that thing. And the, it was funny. He he seemed so pissed. He got red on the fact where he was like, nobody knows who they are. You know, he was talking about the feds. That yeah. so the Federal Reserve in America is the central banks. But, but what it really pissed you off is when you look at the Constitution and it's unconstitutional to charge personal tax. And yet, when the Federal Reserve came into power in 1913, matter of fact, this this will help you draw. So, if you look at the timeline, the Federal Reserve came into power in 1913. The next year, World War One started. <laughs> I'm, I'm yeah. just saying, man, you can't make this stuff up. You can't make this shit up, man. No. And the thing is that, so I have, so I will say this. Yes, we need text to like support certain things, services that affect us. Like, you know, freaking people to come pick up the trash, mm -hmm. sewer, water, stuff like that. I have no problem with that. But it's just like, the more you think about this shit and then what's happening now is that the people who are really going to feel the most of this is really the people in the middle class. Yep, the middle like, class. Like all just middle class because the low class people ain't going to feel it because they ain't, they ain't making enough money to be taxed anyway. Yeah. And then the but they get taxed, they get taxed through the lottery. What I've learned, the secret of the, the poor people getting taxed is through lottery, mm -hmm. and now there's a liquor tax. Think about it. <laughs> that's that's the other part, too. Yeah. I mean, and yeah, I hear you there. I mean, I, I was kind of thinking more of the part where 
you know, like W2s, 1099s, like people were actually like working. Oh, yeah, yeah. They got society. So it's like the people in that class, like, they're not, they're not really, because they don't really have enough money to be taxed. And then the thing is, is that once you start getting to the real rich, wealthy people, like we're talking about the top 1%, and even the small percentage of that, the thing is, mm-hmm. they've got they've smartened up. They put all their money in those offshore accounts, so it's like mm-hmm. they ain't got. They already know how not to get taxed, and they, <laughs> and they and they have so much money. Where and the thing is, they're in that class where they know all those loopholes because they qualify for those loopholes. But like mm-hmm. people who are in the middle class, particularly even if you're in the middle upper middle class like me, like I already kind of see this coming. Where now it's like, well, we gotta tax somebody. <laughs> so you know that's what and so i'm telling you i've been thinking more and more about now i might change how i vote i'm gonna see how that but because it's like man i'm, I'm like wait, i'm like kind of thinking about this shit and i'm just like i mean really like so because this country is so far in debt right and we're going to be more and more in debt because these bonds are ious mm-hmm. and it's just that like never ending just that's cycle true. man yep never ending. It's, so, it's, it's going to crash get, and it's only going to get worse. So inflation's going up. I mean, and therefore and the they're, going to have to, they're going to have to tax more and more and more. And what pisses me off about these politicians, and I will even say something that I think, you know, I'm starting to wake up to this as well as like some other black, you know, black people, particularly black men, black women, unfortunately, I don't think we're going to have to really wake up to this. <laughs> black men realize it's like, man, hold up, man. Like, you think about how we've I think we've all been indoctrinated to the fact that, you know, Republicans were like all for like the big bangs, blah, blah, blah. And then the Democrats were also for the people. And it's like, that's not true at all. I think both parties are full of shit. But it's like wings are the same bird. Left wing, yeah. right wing, wings are the same bird. But the thing is, with the Democrats, they're always, you know, they always want to be like, oh, well, tax the rich, tax the rich and all this shit. But if you look at the accounts the motherfuckers have, they in that super elite, too. And so Mm -hmm. I think they want to push that so-called communism where it's like, okay, we have a very, very, very small elite class. And then we had, then, then it's like everybody else, then we can control more of the masks. And I think they more part of that game than even the Republicans. And so that like, when you see like Bernie Sanders going up there and Elizabeth Warren and talking about these like consumer protection agencies and Mm -hmm. these bang wild, I'm like, man, you look at their portfolios. They are so right. they're such hypocrites, man. And so I yeah, remember when man. Obama said he came into the office in, in student loan debt. And yeah. in eight years, he came out a multimillionaire. <laughs> Ooh, <laughs> really? Like, what's really going on? They said the salary of a president is only two hundred thousand dollars. If you factor in inflation, maybe four hundred thousand. Yeah, it's four hundred thousand. You know what I'm saying? What how you coming out multimillionaires? Man, well, and and to to that point, right. You think about it. Well, one, when you when you become president, right? Like you're already in that super secret society elite class. Like, I mean, that yeah. you, you're going. I mean, you're going to come out way richer, which you are. <laughs> um, and then the thing is, you know what they do with tax laws, right? And you even hear Biden will say this. They're like, well, people who are making four hundred thousand under, the rates won't go up. And I'm like, well, yeah. Why they set it at four hundred thousand? Because that's the president's salary. Hell, they ain't going to tax themselves <laughs> more. <laughs> man, think about that. man motherfuckers, think about that. motherfuckers some damn crooks man I'm telling you like <laughs> but yo how the heck did that book fall on your lap you said your your god your god brother gave it to you yeah man my god brother gave this shit to me man uh well he he um actually you know what's funny because there was actually another book and man where do i have it hold on i could tell you the name of the um the other book yeah, Man, uh, do I have it up here? Shit, man. Oh, man. Oh, man. Um, man, it's um, I think the other book was uh, man, I couldn't find it, but I think it's another Rudolph Windsor book, man. It was like Valley of the Dry Bones. Yeah, Valley of the Dry. You know what? I read that after I read Babylon the Ten Book Two, and I was still like, you know how you read a good book and you still got the momentum to read his other book. Yeah. When I read the Valley of the Dry Bones, I wasn't feeling it. He. Oh, went, you weren't feeling okay. He went too hard on being. You could tell he converted from whatever he was to a Hebrew Israelite, because then it, for me, Valley of the Dry Bones, he was bashing white people like. 
Bro, stick to the facts. The 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 you know what I mean? Babylon and Tim Book 2, you was laying down facts. He was laying down, I don't know where you at in it, but he started talking about the migration from uh, mm -hmm. Jerusalem all through Africa. Yeah. And I'm like, yo, why nobody ever taught us this? Oh, why man. nobody ever taught us what happened after Rome conquered Jerusalem? And where did all them blacks go? Mm -hmm. Let me see if I can find it too, bro. Wait, hold on. Well, I'm listening though. Let me see if I can. Nah, find man. It. And you know what, man? I because I was reading this book consistently one time, and then um, mainly when I was reading it more so towards kind of like when I was finishing up fellowship because I had some more free time, and then mm -hmm. before I started working again, and then now, yeah, I, I need to get back on it. I'm I'm studying for my critical care boards, and I take that like mid November. So actually, after that, um, I'll probably be getting back on this more because, man, the stuff that I was reading, I think the last chapter. I ended up on, shoot, this was like, I was at the original Black Jews chapter, which was chapter four. That's kind of like the last thing I remember reading. And then I think I was going, uh, shoot. Then I was thinking I was going on chapter five of Black Civilization Africa. That's kind of where I left off. I still got hey, a you know, we read three. this stuff and they gonna think we like Black nationalists or Black or oh, racist. Well, first of all, Black people can't be racist. I got some prejudiced uncles, but for us to be racist and we got no power is mind boggling. What scares you more that I'm learning who I am or that you, you perceive that I'm going to treat you how you treated us. You know what I mean? It, well, it, it's mind boggling how they so afraid of us learning who we are. And that's the thing, but, but you know, what really disappoints me more is that you have, you probably face more black backlash from other black people, right? <laughs> because I think they're more upset that you actually have the courage to debunk all the bullshit that like you've been taught. And it's like, hold on, I'm gonna actually do the work to like unlearn all the bullshit that I've been taught where a lot of people don't have, and I call it intellectual laziness. A lot of people don't really have that fortitude and that motivation, that discipline. It's like, man, hold on. And, and then sometimes you got to admit that you were wrong and, and, and that's okay. And, and so it's okay to be wrong, but mm -hmm. Then you guys like, okay, I now know this. Now I got to put in the work to relearn all the shit, which is okay because we've all been bamboozled, all right? Like, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and I have no problem saying that. I've, I've learned, like, you know, because we all went through the we same bullshit yep. public school indoctrination system mm. that taught us taught us all the wrong shit. <laughs> but the thing is, if you look at other cultures, though, other cultures. They learn about themselves, like even um, like Koreans and like all the Asian cultures, they have like Saturday school. Right. They go to their own I think what happened, uh, Matt, is that it wasn't hidden from them. Like Exactly, we, that's what like, it is. It wasn't hidden from them. Here, they passed, a, they passed laws that we couldn't see. Like, why? And when I was doing my research, this is what I wanted to show you, I found it. So I was doing my research and came across, bro, I'm 30, 39 years old. When I seen this, I was 37, 36. It's the, 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 the irony of it. Blacks named Europe and European named Africa. You know what I mean? Like there what? was, there was, there was like, there was culture in Europe. Like this first one is Germany. Uh, you see the Moors in Scotland. Yeah. I think that was Spain that says Puka. Like, why they didn't never tell us this? Why is there oh. black faces in a predominantly white, you know what I mean, area? Man, when I tell you this stuff blew my mind. Mm -hmm. it, it blew my mind. Like, why did they just lie to us? But yeah. you're starting to see why. Yeah. You're starting to see why. So I enjoyed this, man. Man, I appreciate I you, man. Uh, Kels, I wonder if he stayed on. I don't know, but yeah. look, man, I'm gonna put the, uh, I'm, I'm gonna look for it now in the whole video and I'm gonna put it in uh, the UGB for, for the brothers to watch, okay? Appreciate it, man. Hey, man, I'm about to get on up out of here uh, myself. Yes, so, man, appreciate this, man. I love you, man. Take it love easy. Love you too, man. man. Yeah.